Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. I'm sorry that I am a little bit late today. I'm a little behind today in general. <laughs> hello, how is everybody on this wonderful book club day? Harvest on CC, MJ. Oh, MJ, I doubt that you're still here to hear from me, but have, have a good day at work. <laughs> Snake, STL, Yellow Ring, Reptile. Oh, thank you guys for coming by to lurk. I very much appreciate that. It will be helpful. <laughs> don't apologize for life. I don't know that anybody is capable of completely apologizing for life. <laughs> How have we been? Oh, thank you, Millie. All of the lurkers. What are bubbles? Oh, the bubbles next to the usernames? Those are the bit badges now. Nowadays. That I have created. <sighs> okay, so. My iPad is upside down. <laughs> Thanks! I'm proud of them. I need to flip this, so. You died 54 times because you can't make this jump. All right, sounds like you're having a great day. Super Adventure Box, is that is that like Mario Maker or is that something else? I know that Mario Maker update was happening. But uh, <sighs> it's been one of those days already, you know? <laughs> it's just been one of those days. And we are here today to read the wonderful story of Jane Eyre. I believe we're starting on chapter 17. Yes, we will be starting on chapter 17. Oh, Reptil! Reptil, you alacritous alchemist! Thank you for resubscribing! Welcome back to the fold! Nearly for a year! You're nearly at a year. Hello, Obi-Wan! Guild Wars 2, massive jumping puzzle that is vindictive, unfair, and cruel, and you love it. That's the one that you were talking about that is, like, intentionally mean, right? That's the one that's definitely meant to be rough. Hey, Jenna! Oh my god! Thank you so much for resubscribing, and congratulations on your one-year anniversary to the fold! Yay! Can we get some chair dances in the chat? It's very... <laughs> Oh my god, STL, get dunked on, your ex. <laughs> Yay, thank you for the chariot dances. You just fell down a cliff and banged your face on all the outcroppings on the way down. All right. Is this, like, happening in its own instance, or is this just, if you die, you also lose all of your stuff in the main guild wars? It sounds pretty intense. <laughs> is that a dabbing penguin, Obi-Wan? I don't know what it is, but I like the dab. All right. So, I won't be able to read as long as I did last week. I, I read, we read a good many chapters last week because I really, really wanted to get to the, the chapter where Mr. Rochester's room is set on fire, which is super exciting. Um, but I won't read that much because it made my throat hurt for, for the rest of the week. So, instead, we'll keep it to a manageable number of chapters. But we've got some mysteries to solve today. Dying isn't that big of a deal in that game. Oh, okay. And it's instance. Super fun if you're masochistic. <laughs> if, if, I'm, if I'm masochistic, give you a shout because the base game is free. Interesting that the base game is free. I'm not masochistic, though. That would definitely make me tear my hair out very easily. Hello, Zabasu. Um, But yes, I will give you guys a little synopsis of where we are in Jane Eyre. Um, especially... Since there's lurkers, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you are here to care about the story, but what happened in the- Oh! Cheers, Harvest! A Baby Yoda for my voice? <laughs> Is that Baby Yoda- Is Baby Yoda healing me? That's adorable. Thank you, Baby Yoda. I love you. <laughs> okay. So, what happened in the last stream? You do. I've spent most of this morning hydrating very intensely. Because um, I've done a bad job of it this past week. So. <laughs> what happened in our last reading of Jane Eyre is Jane came to Thornfield Hall. Jane applied for a position as a governess and without knowing who she was going to work for, she headed off 
across the country with no friends, no family, no one to really care for or look after her if she ended up in a bad situation. And she came upon Thornfield Hall, where she met the little Adele, who is a French-speaking little lady who we discovered was the potential illegitimate offspring of Mr. Rochester, but more likely his mistress's child by another man that he chose to adopt because his mistress abandoned her. So Jane is teaching this wonderful little girl. And in the meantime, Mr. Rochester is being kind of a little bit um, weird towards Jane. How you feel about it is up to you. Some people view him as flirting with Jane. Some people view him as like treating her as an equal, maybe testing her knowledge on some subjects. Um, it's a little open for interpretation, him and his character. Um, but in right before we ended the last stream, Jane awakens in the middle of the night to discover, well, to a noise on her door. And when she eventually goes outside to check what the noise on the door was, she discovers a candle sitting out in the middle of the hallway and smoke emanating from a room down the hall. She busts into the room and she finds out somebody has set fire to Mr. Rochester's bed and he's stupefied by the smoke inside. So she puts out the fire, wakes him up, explains what happened. He says, give me a second. He disappears for a little bit, comes back, and he's like, ah, it was Grace Poole, the servant who hides uh, upstairs and drinks tons of alcohol and sews well. And it's fine. Don't worry about it. Go back to bed, Jane. By the way, let me hold your hand. Thank you so much for saving my life. And Jane's like, you're welcome. And then he just keeps holding on to her hand. She's like, let me go. And he's like, okay, I will. And then he keeps holding on to her hand. She's like, seriously, I gotta go. And he's like, all right, yes, I will. And he's still holding on to her hand. And she's like, I think your old lady is coming. I think the housekeeper's coming. And he's like, fine, goodbye. And then the next day, Jane wakes up and Mr. Rochester is gone. He has left on social engagements with another lady that we know is very pretty that he may or may not be interested in. And Jane has fallen in love with Mr. Rochester, but is trying to convince herself not to be in love with him because nothing can come of it. And also Jane's not very pretty <laughs> and she's got very low self-confidence. That is where we, we are in Jane Eyre. I tried, Dawn. I, the thing is that there's only so much French that you can learn in such a small amount of time. I learned a little bit of French. I, I wish that I had had time to review it today because I'm a little nervous about the pronunciations and I really still don't completely understand how the vowels work. Like, so you don't pronounce the E's but at the end of the words, but sometimes you do and sometimes it's just a little confusing for me. Uh, elle est un, elle est un petit enfant. I tried. Where, where est le toilet? Am I, am I trying? <laughs> am I doing better than before? I was, I'm trying. <laughs> I tried, I tried, but I did not get very far in Duolingo and it was, ooh, it's ooh. Okay, it's ooh, not weh. Okay. I just want to say that when I was, I, w I was looking at the French and I am so annoyed by how many different ways there are to pronounce all of the vowels. Like there's an A and then there's an A with an accent this way and then an A with an accent that way. And then if it's like A-E or A-I or something, it's different. And then there's O and then there's O-U and then there's O-I. And the I'm just like, this is a lot for me to try to pick up in like a couple days. <laughs> Just so that I can read Adele's French. Okay, but I, I'm trying. I'm trying. My pronunciation would offend Parisians. I know that it would. I didn't... Listen, I never said that I would come back speaking French well. I just said that I would come back and have tried to learn a little bit of the pronunciation to make it more bearable for everyone. <laughs> You made it through French 4? I did not. Accent means you pronounce a silent letter is a general rule. Not at all true, but you can go with it. Listen, having no prior experience to French, I duolingoed and they just, you know, they just throw you in there and I'm still trying to piece together with my own brain 
why sometimes the words are pronounced and why sometimes they're not. I figured out that there's like, un, see, and then like, I have a hard time pronouncing it without hearing a French person say it before me and then mimicking it because I just automatically default to like how you would pronounce the word in either German or Korean. So, which is like, if, if anybody has ever tried to learn multiple languages, that's just a thing that happens. Some, when you're trying to learn like a new language, your brain hasn't created a folder specifically for that language yet. So when you see words and you try to pronounce them, it's like, oh, I know this, I know this language thing. That's this one, right? And you're like, no, 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 it's a new one. And you're like, this one, this one. <laughs> it's frustrating. Parisians are offended by Northern French people and Southern French people. Well, I don't need Parisians to love me. <laughs> Simply be an American offended. That's fair. You know, I get it. This is a rule except which, when it isn't, which is a lot of the time. Wow, that's so rude. Oh my god, I'm going to learn French and I'm going to speak it super poorly with a really American accent just to frustrate everybody. Un should be... The un is silent when there's an e afterwards It'll, because you're referring to like a feminine noun though, right? Because that's what Duolingo basic, that's what I figured out from Duolingo is that like if, you're, if it's a boy, it's u, uh, and if it's a girl, then it's un. Fem, right? Un femme and uh, what is the word for uh, jason? What is the what is the word for boy again? Jason, something like that. Un is un homme. That's man. <laughs> I mean, you can tell that I'm trying, right? <laughs> I tried. They do have a council to control their language. I learned about that in my linguistics class. They said French is horrible for that reason. Garçon. Garçon. Yeah. So it's un garçon and un femme. Right? Fia? Fia is girl, right? And femme is woman? Un garçon, un femme. Le enfant terrible. And then I rolled my R. I don't think you're actually supposed to roll your R's in French, but I did because uh, you roll them in German. Listen, I'm I'm sure that by the time we're finished with this book, I if there even is still French at the end of this book, I don't even remember. But if, if there is, I'm sure that well, I'll have greatly improved. <laughs> I know Metal Gear now. Garçon, uh, eh, eh, isn't eh and garçon eh fille fille. I, I don't remember how to say that word. Yeah. <laughs> Not femme. You do roll some of your R's. Garçon. You roll, but sometimes not. The R isn't really in your mouth in French. It's like gars, gar, garçon. Maria. Right? Maria? Is that it? I... I don't know. We have, I have, I have learned a similar way to pronounce the R in a different language, and I'm not sure if it's the same here. Maria? Yeah, so I can do it. I know how to do that R. It's just hard for me to do it in certain words, depending on the vowel and consonant placements. It's hard for me to go from, like, up here to in here, you know what I mean? I'm just a wee baby. I, I need some practice, you know? I need some time. I've had literally, like, <laughs> approximately, like, Less than an hour's worth of French so far. <laughs> you know. Duolingoing my way. We oui, très bien. Anyways, so the point, point being, Adele speaks French in this book. She's she's the little girl and she speaks almost exclusively French and hopefully it won't like cause all of your ears to bleed. <laughs> I sound much better now. Il faut practice. Okay, yeah. Nope, don't know how to say that word. En comprend. Nope, don't know how to say that. See, I know some things, but like, man, I've, I, I've only experienced words with mostly vowels so far. I, I'll figure it out. I'll get more. Où est le toilette? Toilet. My brain just went, toiletta! <laughs> toiletta! Does she say hello? Hello from the other side. 
dad. And she sounds exactly like that when she like like she's a tiny little girl, but when she says hello, it's like <gasps> <laughs> she just screams it. All right, focusing. I'm re I'm pretty excited because I think by the time the stream ends, my fellow shop tighteners, we're gonna have the guild will have gone over to the other end, um, and and the perks will be available. And I'm very excited for that moment. I keep mastering more items than you. Damn straight I do. I I stopped focusing on mastering for a while because I was focusing on uh, getting 10 million gold so that I could upgrade my shop. And then I went back to focusing on mastering. So here we go. <laughs> you can try, Chase. You can try. <laughs> hey, Bully Birdie. I'm actually picking it up well. Fingers crossed. If I just do Duolingo every day for a week, then by the time we come back, maybe everybody will be even more impressed. Language learning streams a go-go. I didn't know that so many people in the fold knew and spoke French. There's just an infinite, like, so much more of a of a well of knowledge here than in than for other languages. So I might as well, you know, take advantage <laughs> while you're here. You are Don. Yeah, in two days you've pulled even and ahead, but also, Chase, you got to profit from a really well-functioning guild for your first, like, 30-something levels, whereas I didn't get the fold guild until I was level 35! So... <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You did help everyone profit before you did anything, but I'm just saying... I actually think that the game is balanced in a way that, like, makes everybody kind of want to end up at the same level. So, like, people who are at the top... Because, like, you know, the guild needs to get better. I, I literally couldn't make, like, tier four or five items for, like, a straight week. And so I think we're gonna hit, like, the next... Whatever the next cap is for the higher levels. And the lower level people will catch up again. You know, I think that it's built that way. How many people spoke German and were learning Korean Japanese? That's true. We're a very language learning group. Listen, we're just the crotchety old people who are like, Back in my day, I had to struggle by myself to get anything done. <laughs> Obi-Wan is cool. I don't know how to say that. Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan. I don't know how to pronounce that in French, but Obi-Wan, what is the word for is? Obi-Wan, isn't it say? Obi-Wan say très bien? Is that correct? Très, très bien? Back in the throat? Eh? Yeah. Okay. Say is, it is. Okay. Eh. Obi-Wan est très bien. There we go. We can all help now that we're in the same guild. Yeah, it's true. We're all going to be catapulting to the stars. It's fine. Also, I expect that some of you guys are definitely going to surpass me. I just, like, you guys are gunning for it, and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to catch up. Diagrammed sentences? It sounds like a lot of hard work. Okay. So, let's bring it all in. Bring the energy, all of the, uh, all of the energy back, the excitement about French. Is there French in this chapter? I am so concerned. I was thinking maybe I should just like read ahead and, oh no, there is. Oh no, there is and I don't know any of these words. Okay. Well, I'm gonna try my best. So, without further ado, if you all would like to turn to chapter 17, the PDF is accessible with exclamation point PDF and you can catch up and follow along if you'd like to. Otherwise, you can just listen along to me reading like it's a little audiobook. I'm going to put on our nice uh, reading music, which has been fine <laughs> this whole time, and we will begin. I would paste them into Google Translate, but I'm reading on my iPad. Oh my god, Chase, that's not fair. Now you're going to get ahead of me. <laughs> okay. Let us go. A week passed, and no news arrived of Mr. Rochester. 
Ten days, and still he did not come. Mrs. Fairfax said she should not be surprised if he were to go straight from the Lee to London, and thence to the Continent, and not show his face again at Thornfield for a year to come. He had not unfrequently quitted it in a manner quite as abrupt and unexpected. When I heard this, I was beginning to feel a strange chill and failing at the heart. I was actually permitting myself to experience a sickening sense of disappointment. But rallying my wits and recollecting my principles, I at once called my sensations to order, and it was wonderful how I got over the temporary blunder, how I cleared up the mistake of supposing Mr. Rochester's movements a matter in which I had any cause to take a vital interest. Not that I humbled myself by a slavish notion of inferiority. On the contrary, I just said, you have nothing to do with the master of Thornfield, further than to receive the salary he gives you for teaching his protégé, and to be grateful for such respectful and kind treatment as, if you do your duty, you have a right to expect at his hands. Be sure that is the only tie he seriously acknowledges between you and him, so don't make him the object of your fine feelings, your raptures, agonies, and so forth. He is not of your order. Keep to your caste and be too self-respecting to lavish the love of the whole heart, soul, and strength where such a gift is not wanted and would be despised. I went on with my day's business tranquilly, but ever and anon vague suggestions kept wandering across my brain of reasons why I should quit Thornfield, and I kept involuntarily framing advertisements and pondering conjectures about new situations. These thoughts I did not think to check. They might germinate and bear fruit if they could. Mr. Rochester had been absent upwards of a fortnight, and when the post brought Mrs. Fairfax a letter. "'It is from the master,' said she, as she looked at the direction. "'Now I suppose we shall know whether we ought to expect his return or not.' And while she broke the seal and perused the document, I went on taking my coffee. We were at breakfast. It was hot, and I attributed to that circumstance a fiery glow which suddenly rose to my face." Why my hand shook, and why I involuntarily spilt half the contents of my cup into my saucer, I did not choose to consider. Well, I sometimes think we are too quiet, but we run a chance of being busy enough now, for a while at least, said Mrs. Fairfax, still holding the note before her spectacles. Ere I permitted myself to request an explanation, I tied the string of Adele's pinafore, which happened to be loose. Having helped her also to another bun and refilled her mug with milk, I said nonchalantly. Mr. Rochester is not likely to return soon, I suppose? Indeed he is. In three days, he says. That will be next Thursday, and not alone either. I don't know how many of the fine people at the Lee are coming with him. He sends directions for all the best bedrooms to be prepared, and the library and drawing rooms are to be cleaned out. I am to get more kitchen hands from the George Inn at Millcote, and from wherever else I can, and the ladies will bring their maids and the gentlemen their valets, so we shall have a full house of it. And Mrs. Rochester swallowed her breakfast, and hastened away to commence operations. The three days were, as she had foretold, busy enough. I had thought all the rooms at Thornfield beautifully clean and well arranged, but it appears I was mistaken. Three women were got to help, and such scrubbing, such brushing, such washing of paint and beating of carpets, such taking down and putting up of pictures, such polishing of mirrors and lusters, such lighting of fires and bedrooms, such airing of sheets and feather beds on hearths, I never beheld, either before or since. Adele ran quite wild in the midst of it. The preparations for company and the prospect of their arrival seemed to throw her into ecstasies. She would have Sophie to look over all her toilettes, as she called frocks, to furbish up any that were passé, and to air and arrange the new. For herself, she did nothing but caper about in the front chambers, jump on and off the bedsteads, and lie on the mattresses and piled up bolsters and pillows before the enormous fires ro roaring in the chimneys. From school duties she was exonerated. Mrs. Fairfax had pressed me into her service, and I was all day in the storeroom, helping, or hindering, her and the cook, learning to make custards and cheesecakes and French pastry, to truss game and garnish d dessert dishes. The party were expected to arrive on Thursday afternoon in time for dinner at six. During the intervening period, I had no time to nurse chimeras, and I believe I was as active and gay as anybody, Adele accepted. Still, now and then, I received a damping check to my cheerfulness, and was, in spite of myself, thrown back on the region of doubts and portents and dark conjectures. This was when I chanced to see the third-story staircase door, which, of late, had always been kept locked, 
open slowly and give passage to the form of Grace Poole in prim cap, white apron, and handkerchief. When I watched her glide along the gallery, her quiet tread muffled in a list slipper, when I saw her look into the bustling, topsy-turvy bedrooms, just say a word, perhaps, to the charwoman about the proper way to polish a grate or clean a marble mantelpiece, or take stains from papered walls, and then pass on. She would thus descend to the kitchen once a day, eat her dinner, smoke a moderate pipe on the hearth, and go back carrying her pot of porter with her, for her private solace in her own gloomy upper haunt. Only one hour in the twenty-four did she pass with her fellow servants below. All the rest of her time was spent in lo some low-sealed oaken chamber of the second story. There she sat and sewed, and probably laughed drearily to herself, as companionless as a prisoner in his dungeon. The strangest thing of all was that not a soul in the house except me noticed her habits or seemed to marvel at them. No one discussed her position or employment. No one pitied her solitude or isolation. I once, indeed, overheard part of a dialogue between Leah and one of the charwomen, of which Grace formed the subject. Leah had been saying something I had not caught, and the charwoman remarked, "'She gets good wages, I guess.' "'Yes,' said Leah. "'I wish I had as good, not that mine are to complain of. There's no stinginess at Thornfield, but they're not one-fifth of the sum Mrs. Poole receives. And she's laying by. She goes every quarter to the bank at Millcote. I should not wonder, but she has saved enough to keep her independent if she liked to leave.' But I suppose she's got used to the place, and then she's not forty yet, and strong and able for anything. It's too soon for her to give up business. She is a good hand, I dare say, said the charwoman. Ah, she understands what she has to do. Nobody better, rejoined Leah significantly. And it is not every one who could fill her shoes, not for all the money she gets. <laughs> that it is not, was the reply. I wonder whether the master... The charwoman was going on, but here Leah turned and perceived me, and she instantly gave her companion a nudge. "'Doesn't she know?' I heard the woman whisper. Leah shook her head, and the conversation was, of course, dropped. All I had gathered from it amounted to this, that there was a mystery at Thornfield, and that from participation in that mystery I was purposely excluded. Thursday came. All work had been completed, and the, the previous evening— Carpets were laid down, bed hangings festooned, radiant white counterpanes spread, toilet tables arranged, furniture rubbed, flowers piled in vases. Both chambers and saloons looked as fresh and bright as hands could make them. The hall, too, was scoured, and the great carved clock, as well as the steps and banisters of the staircase, were polished to the brightness of glass. In the dining room, the sideboard flashed resplendent with plate. In the drawing room and boudoir, vases of exotics bloomed on all sides. Afternoon arrived. Mrs. Fairfax assumed her best black satin gown, her gloves, and her gold watch, for it was her part to receive the company, to conduct the ladies to their rooms, and etc. Adele, too, would be dressed, though I thought she had little chance of being introduced to the party that day, at least. However, to please her, I allowed Sophie to apparel her in one of her short, full muslin frocks. For myself, I had no need to make any change. I should not be called upon to quit my sanctum of the schoolroom, for a sanctum it was now become to me, a very pleasant refuge in time of trouble. It had been a mild, serene spring day, one of those days in which, towards the end of March or the beginning of April, rise shining over the earth as heralds of summer. It was drawing to an end now, but the evening was even warm, and I sat at work in the schoolroom with the window open. "'It gets late,' said Mrs. Fairfax, entering in rustling state. I am glad I ordered dinner an hour after the time Mr. Rochester mentioned, for it is past six now. I have sent John down to the gates to see if there is anything on the road. One can see a long way from thence in the direction of Millcote. She went to the window. Here he is, said she. Well, John, any news? They're coming, ma'am, was the answer. They'll be here in ten minutes. Adele flew to the window. I followed, taking care to stand on one side, so that, screened by the curtain, I could see without being seen. The ten minutes John had given seemed very long, but at last wheels were heard. Four equestrians galloped up the drive, and after them came two open carriages. Fluttering veils and waving plumes filled the vehicles. Two of the cavaliers were young, dashing-looking gentlemen. The third was Mr. Rochester, on his black horse. Mez Mesror? His black horse, Mesror. Pilot bounding before him, at his side rode a lady, and he and she were the first of the party. 
Her purple riding habit almost swept the ground, her veil streamed long on the breeze, mingling with its transparent folds, and gleaming through them shone rich raven ringlets. "'Miss Ingram!' exclaimed Mrs. Fairfax, and away she hurried to her post below. The cavalcade, following the sweep of the drive, <clears throat> quickly turned the angle of the house, and I lost sight of it. Adele now petitioned to go down, but I took her on my knee and gave her to understand that she must not, on any account, think of venturing in sight of the ladies, either now or at any other time, unless expressly sent for, that Mr. Rochester would be very angry, and etc. Some natural tears she, she shed on being told this, but as I began to look very grave, she consented at last to wipe them. A joyous stir was now audible in the hall. Gentlemen's deep tones and ladies' silvery accents blent harmoniously together, and distinguishable ab above all, though not loud, was the sonorous voice of the master of Thornfield Hall, welcoming his fair and gallant guests under its roof. Then light steps ascended the stairs, and there was a tripping through the gallery, and soft, cheerful laughs, and opening and closing doors, and, for a time, a hush. Elle est chante de toilette, said Adele, who, listening attentively, had followed every movement, and she sighed. Chez maman, said she, quand y, y <laughs> avait du monde, je le suivais <laughs> partout au salon et à leur chambre, souvent je regardais <laughs> les femmes des chambres coiffeurs et habillés les dames et c'était si amusant comme <laughs> cela on apprend. Listen, I did my best. Don't you feel hungry, Adele? Ma oui, mademoiselle. Voilà cinq ou six jueres que nous n'avons pas mangé. Well now, while the ladies are in their rooms, I will venture down and get you something to eat. <laughs> and issuing from my asylum with precaution, I sought a back stairs which conducted directly to the kitchen. All in that region was fire and commotion. The soup and fish were in the last stage of projection, and the cook hung over her crucibles in a frame of mind and body, threatening spontaneous combustion. In the servants' hall, two coachmen and three gentlemen's gentlemen stood or sat round the fire. The Abigails, I suppose, were all upstairs with their mistresses. The new servants that had been hired from Millcote were bustling about everywhere. Threading this chaos, I at last reached the larder. There I took possession of a cold chicken, a roll of bread, some tarts, a plate or two, and a knife and fork. With this booty I made a hasty retreat. I had regained the gallery and was just shutting the back door behind me, when an accelerated hum warned me that the ladies were about to issue from their chambers. I could not proceed to the schoolroom without passing some of their doors, and running the risk of being surprised with my cargo of victualage, so I stood still at this end, which, being windowless, was dark, quite dark now, for the sun was set and twilight gathering. Presently the chambers gave up their fair tenants one after another. Each came out gaily and airily, with dress that gleamed lustrous through the dusk. For a moment they stood grouped together at the other extremity of the gallery, conversing in a key of sweet, subdued vivacity. They then descended the staircase almost as noiselessly as a bright mist rolls down a hill. Their collective appearance had left on me an impression of high-born elegance, such as I had never before received. I found Adele peeping through the schoolroom door, which she held ajar. "'What beautiful ladies!' cried she in English. "'Oh, I wish I might go to them. "'Do you think Mr. Rochester will send for us by and by, after dinner?' "'No, indeed, I don't. "'Mr. Rochester has something else to think about. "'Never mind the ladies tonight. "'Perhaps you will see them tomorrow. "'Here is your dinner.' "'She was really hungry, so the chicken and tart served to divert her attention for a time. "'It was well I secured this forage for both she, I, and Sophie, "'to whom I conveyed a share of our repast,' would have run a chance of getting no dinner at all. Everyone downstairs was too much engaged to think of us. The dessert was not carried out till after nine, and at ten footmen were still running to and fro with trays and coffee cups. I allowed Adele to sit up much later than usual, for she declared she could not possibly go to sleep while the doors kept opening and shutting below, and people bustling about. Besides, she added, a message might possibly come from Mr. Rochester when she was undressed. Et alors, quel dommage! 
I told her stories as long as she would listen to them, and then for a change I took her out into the gallery. The hall lamp was now lit, and it amused her to look over the balustrade and watch the servants passing backwards and forwards. When the evening was far advanced, a sound of music issued from the drawing room, whither the piano had been removed. Adele and I sat down on the top of the stairs to listen. Presently a voice blent with the rich tones of the instrument. It was a lady who sang, and very sweet her notes were. The solo over, a duet followed, and then a glee, a joyous conversational murmur filled up the intervals. I listened long. Suddenly I discovered that my ear was wholly intent on analyzing the mingled sounds and trying to discriminate amidst the confusion of accents, those of Mr. Rochester, and when it caught them, which it soon did, it found a further task in framing the tones, rendered by distance inarticulate, into words. The clock struck eleven. I looked at Adele, whose head linked against my shoulder. Her eyes were waxing heavy, so I took her up in my arms and carried her off to bed. It was near one before the gentlemen and ladies sought their chambers. The next day was as fine as its predecessor. It was devoted by the party to an excursion to some site in the neighborhood. They set out early in the forenoon, some on horseback, the rest in carriages. I witnessed both the departure and the return. Miss Ingram, as before, was the only lady equestrian, and, as before, Mr. Rochester galloped at her side. The two rode a little apart from the rest. I pointed out this circumstance to Mrs. Fairfax, who was standing at the window with me. "'You said it was not likely they should see of being married,' said I. But you see, Mr. Rochester evidently prefers her to any of the other ladies. Yes, I dare say. No doubt he admires her. And she, him, I added. Look how she leans her head towards him as if she were conversing confidentially. I wish I could see her face. I have never had a glimpse of it yet. You will see her this evening, answered Mrs. Fairfax. I happened to remark to Mr. Rochester how much Adele wished to be introduced to the ladies, and he said, Oh! Let her come to the drawing-room after dinner, and request Miss Eyre to accompany her. Yes, he said that from mere politeness. I need not go, I'm sure, I answered. Well, I observed to him that, as you were unused to company, I did not think you would like appear bef appearing before so gay a party, all strangers. And he replied in his quick way, Nonsense! If she objects, tell her it is my particular wish, and if she resists, they all shall come and fetch her in case of contumacy. I will not give him that trouble, I answered. I will go, if no better may be, but I don't like it. Shall you be there, Mrs. Fairfax? No. I pleaded off, and he admitted my plea. I'll tell you how to manage so as to avoid the embarrassment of making a formal entrance, which is the most disagreeable part of the business. I'll support you. You must go to the drawing-room while it is empty, before the ladies leave the dinner-table. Choose your seat in any quiet nook you like. You need not stay long after the gentlemen come in, unless you please. Just let Mr. Rochester see you are there, and then slip away. Nobody will notice you. Zack, thank you for resubscribing. Welcome back to the fold. <laughs> will these people remain long, do you think? Perhaps two or three weeks. Certainly not more. After the Easter recess, Sir George Lynn, who was lately elected member for Millcote, will have to go up to town and take his seat. I dare say Mr. Rochester will accompany him. It surprises me that he has already made so protracted a stay at Thornfield. It was with some trepidation that I perceived the hour approach when I was to repair with my charge to the drawing room. Adele had been in a state of ecstasy all day after hearing she was to be presented to the ladies in the evening, and it was not till Sophie commenced the operation of dressing her that she sobered down. Then the importance of the process quickly steadied her, and by the time she had her curls arranged and well smoothed, drooping clusters, her pink satin frock put on, her long sash tied, and her lace mittens adjusted, she looked as grave as any judge. No need to warn her not to disarrange her attire. When she was dressed, she sat demurely down in her little chair, taking care previously to lift up the satin skirt for fear she should crease it, and assured me she would not stir thence till I was ready. This I quickly was. My best dress, the silver-gray one, purchased for Miss Temple's wedding and never worn since, was soon put on. My hair was soon smoothed. My sole ornament, the pearl brooch, soon assumed. We descended. Fortunately, there was another entrance to the drawing room than that through the saloon where they were all seated at dinner. We found the apartment vacant, a large fire burning silently on the marble earth, 
and wax candles shining in bright solitude amid the exquisite flowers with which the tables were adorned. The crimson curtain hung before the arch, slight as was the separation this drapery formed from the party in, adjoining, in the adjoining saloon. They spoke in so low a key that nothing of their conversation could be distinguished beyond a soothing murmur. Adele, who appeared to be still under the influence of a most solemnizing impression, sat down without a word on the footstool I pointed out to her. I retired to a window seat, and taking a book from a table near, endeavored to read. Adele brought her stool to my feet. Ere long, she touched my knee. What is it, Adele? Est-ce que je ne puis pas prendre une sur de ces fleurs magnifiques, mademoiselle, seulement pour compléter ma toilette? <laughs> you think too much of your toilette, Adele, but you may have a flower and I took a rose from a vase and fastened it in her sash. She sighed a sigh of ineffable satisfaction, as if her cup of happiness were now full. I turned my face away to conceal a smile I could not suppress. There was something ludicrous as well as painful in the little Parisienne's earnest and innate devotion to matters of dress. A soft sound of rising now became audible. The curtain was swept back from the arch, though it appeared the dining room, with its lit luster pouring down light on the silver and glass of a magnificent dessert service covering a long table. A band of ladies stood in the opening. They entered, and the curtain fell behind them. There were but eight, yet somehow as they flocked in, they gave the impression of a much larger number. Some of them were very tall, many were dressed in white, and all had a sweeping amplitude of array that seemed to magnify their persons as a mist magnifies the moon. I rose and curtsied to them. One or two bent their heads in return. The others only stared at me. They dispersed about the room, reminding me by the lightness and buoyancy of their movements of a flock of white plumy birds. Some of them threw themselves in half-reclining positions on the sofas and ottomans. Some bent over the tables and examined the flowers and books. The rest gathered in a group round the fire. All talked in a low but clear tone, which seemed habitual to them. I knew their names afterwards, and may as well mention them now. First, there was Mrs. Eshton and two of her daughters. She had evidently been a handsome woman, and was well-preserved still. <laughs> Hello, madame. You look well preserved today. <laughs> of her daughters, the eldest, Amy, was rather little, naive and childlike in face and manner, and piquant in form. Her white muslin dress and blue sash became her well. The second, Louisa, was taller and more elegant in figure, with a very pretty face. Of that order, the French term minois chiffon, both sisters were fair as lilies. Lady Lynn was a large and stout personage of about forty, very erect, very haughty-looking, richly dressed in a satin robe of changeful sheen. Her dark hair shone glossily under the shade of an azure plume, and within the circlet of a band of gems. Mrs. Colonel Dent was less showy, but I thought more ladylike. She had a slight figure, a pale gentle face, and fair hair. Her black satin dress, her scarf of rich foreign lace, and her pearl ornaments pleased me better than the rainbow radiance of the titled dame. But the three most distinguished, partly because... Grab your sword! Oop, dance. The whole. Oh! Said, Eku? Eku. Okay, good to know, Chase. Feel the niche, hello, hello! Welcome in, everybody! Thank you so much for the raid. We are in the middle of reading Jane Eyre, chapter 17. Uh, P.D. Eska? Is pronounced Eska? Hmm. Really? Um, but yes, feel free to join us, exclamation point PDF, if you would so like. And... Thank you. But the three most distinguished, partly perhaps because the tallest figures of the band, were the Dowager Lady Ingram and her daughters, Blanche and Mary. They were all three of the loftiest stature of women. The dowager might be between forty and fifty. Her shape was still fine, her hair, by candlelight at least, still black. Her teeth, too, were still apparently perfect. Most people would have termed her a splendid woman of her age, and so she was, no doubt, physically speaking. But then there was an expression of almost insupportable haughtiness in her bearing and countenance. 
She had Roman features and a double chin, disappearing into a throat like a pillar. These features appeared to me not only inflated and darkened, but even furrowed with pride, and the chin was sustained by the same principle, in a position of almost preternatural erectness. She had likewise a fierce and hard eye. It reminded me of Mrs. Reed's. She mouthed her words in speaking, her voice was deep, its inflections very pompous, very dogmatical, very intolerable in short. A crimson velvet robe and a shawl of turban, a shawl turban of some gold wrought Indian fabric invested her, I suppose she thought, with a truly imperial dignity. Blanche and Mary were of equal stature, straight and tall as poplars. Mary was too slim for her height, but Blanche was molded like a diem. I regarded her, of course, with special interest. First, I wished to see whether her appearance accorded with Mrs. Fairfax's description. Secondly, whether it at all resembled the fancy miniature I had painted of her. And thirdly, it will out, whether it were such as I should fancy likely to suit Mrs. Mr. Rochester's taste. As far as person went, she answered point for point, both to my picture and Mrs. Fairfax's description. The noble bust, the sloping shoulders, the graceful neck, the dark eyes and black ringlets were all there. But her face? Her face was like her mother's, a youthful, unfurrowed likeness. The same low brow, the same high features, the same pride. It was not, however, so saturnine a pride. She laughed continually, her laugh was satirical, and so was the habitual expression of her arched and haughty lip. Genius is said to be self-conscious. I cannot tell whether Miss Ingram was a genius, but she was self-conscious, remarkably self-conscious indeed. She entered into a discourse on botany with a gentle Mrs. Dent. It seemed Mrs. Dent had not studied that science, though, as she said, she liked flowers, especially wild ones. Miss Ingram had, and she ran over its vocabulary with an air. I presently perceived she was, what is vernacularly termed, trailing Mrs. Dent. <laughs> that is, playing on her ignorance. Her trail might be clever, but it was decidedly not good-natured. I, I love the fact that trailing is so close to trolling. It's like nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. She played. Her execution was brilliant. She sang. Her voice was fine. She talked French apart to her mamma, and she talked it well, with fluency and with a good accent. Mary had a milder and more open countenance than Blanche, softer features too, and a skin some shades fairer. Miss Ingram was dark as a Spaniard. But Mary was deficient in life. Her face lacked expression, her eyes luster. She had nothing to say, and having once taken her seat, remained fixed like a statue in its niche. The sisters were both attired in spotless white. And did I now think Miss Ingram such a choice as Mr. Rochester would be likely to make? I could not tell. I did not know his taste in female beauty. If he liked the majestic, she was the very type of majesty. Then she was accomplished sprightly. Most gentlemen would admire her, I thought, and that he did admire her, I already seemed to have obtained proof. To remove the last shade of doubt, it remained but to see them together. You are not to suppose, reader, that Adele has all this time been sitting motionless on the stool at my feet. No, when the ladies entered, she rose, advanced to meet them, made a stately reverence, and said with gravity, Bonjour, madame. And Miss Ingram had looked down at her with a mocking air and exclaimed, Oh, what a little puppet. Lady Lynn had remarked, It is Mr. Rochester's ward, I suppose, the little French girl he was speaking of. Mrs. Dent had kindly taken her hand and given her a kiss. Amy and Louisa Eshton had cried out simultaneously, What a love of a child! And then they had called her to a sofa, where she now sat, ensconced between them, chattering alternately in French and broken English, absorbing not only the young ladies' attention, but that of Mrs. Eshton and Lady Lynde, and getting spoilt to her heart's content. At last coffee is brought in, and the gentlemen are summoned. I sit in the shade, if any shade there be in this brilliant lit apart brilliantly lit apartment, the window curtain half hides me. Strange, strange sudden shift to the present tense. Again the arch yawns, they come. The collective appearance of the gentlemen, like that of the ladies, is very imposing. They are all costumed in black. Most of them are tall, some young. Henry and Frederick Lynn are very dashing sparks indeed, and Colonel Dent is a fine soldierly man. Mr. Eshton, the magistrate of the district, is gentlemanlike. His hair is quite white, his eyebrows and whiskers still dark, which gives him something of the appearance of a 
Pierre Nobel, Nobel, Pierre Nobel de Theater. I don't know. Lord Ingram, like his sisters, is very tall. Like them also, he is handsome, but he shares Mary's apathetic and listless look. He seems to have more length of limb than vivacity of blood or vigor of brain. And where is Mr. Rochester? He comes in and last. I am not looking at the arch, yet I see him enter. I try to concentrate my attention on those knit netting needles, on the meshes of the purse I am forming. I wish to think only of the work I have in my hands, to see only the silver beads and silk threads that lie in my lap, whereas I distinctly behold his figure, and I inevitably recall the moment when I last saw it, just after I had rendered him what he deemed an essential service. And he, holding my hand and looking down on my face, surveyed me with eyes that revealed a heart full and eager to overflow in whose emotions I had a part. How near I had approached him at that moment! What had occurred since calculated to change his and my relative positions? Yet now, how distant, how far estranged we were! So far estranged that I did not expect him to come and speak to me. I did not wonder when, without looking at me, he took a seat at the other side of the room and began conversing with some of the ladies. Oh, thanks, Rex. Bye, I hope your internet comes back. No sooner did I see that his attention was riveted on them and that I might gaze without being observed than my eyes were drawn involuntarily to his face. I could not keep their lids under control. They would rise, and the irids would focus on him. I looked and had an acute pleasure in looking, a precious yet poignant pleasure, pure gold with a steely point of agony, a pleasure like what the thirst perishing man might feel who knows the well to which he has crept is poisoned, yet stoops and drinks divine draughts nevertheless. Most, most true is it that beauty is in, the Baha'i, is in the eye of the gazer. My master's colorless olive face, square, massive brow, broad and jetty eyebrows, deep eyes, strong features, firm, grim mouth, all energy, decision, and will, were not beautiful according to rule, but they were more than beautiful to me. They were full of an interest, an influence that quite mastered me, that took my feelings from my own power and fettered them in his. I had not intended to love him. The reader knows I had wrought hard to extirpate from my soul the germs of love there detected, and now, at the first renewed view of him, they spontaneously arrived, green and strong. He made me love him without looking at me. I compared him with his guests. What was the gallant grace of the Lynns, the languid elegance of Lord Ingram, even the military distinction of Colonel Dent contrasted with his look of native peace and genuine power? I had no sympathy in their appearance, their expression, yet I could imagine that most observers would call them attractive, handsome, imposing. While they would pronounce Mr. Rochester at once harsh-featured and melancholy-looking, I saw them smile, laugh. It was nothing. The light of the candles had as much soul in it as their smile, the tinkle of the bell as much significance as their laugh. I saw Mr. Rochester smile. His stern features softened, his eye grew both brilliant and gentle, its ray both searching and sweet. He was talking at the moment to Louisa and Amy Eshton. I wondered to see them receive with calm that look which seemed to me so penetrating. I expected their eyes to fall, their color to rise under it, yet I was glad when I found they were in no sense moved. He is not to them what he is to me, I thought. He is not of their kind. I believe he is of mine. I am sure he is. I feel akin to him. I understand the language of his countenance and movements. Though rank and wealth sever us widely, I have something in my brain and heart and my blood and nerves that assimilates me mentally to him. Did I say a few days since that I had nothing to do with him but to receive my salary at his hands? Did I forbid myself to think of him in any other light than as a paymaster? Blasphemy against nature. Every good, true, vigorous feeling I have gathers impulsively round him. I know I must conceal my sentiments. I must smother hope. I must remember that he cannot care for me, care much for me. For when I say that I am of his kind, I do not mean that I have his force to influence and his spell to attract. I mean only that I have certain tastes and feelings in common with him. I must then repeat continually that we are forever sundered. And yet, while I breathe and think, I must love him. Okay, Jane. <laughs> He's different from the other boys, and Jane's different from the other girls, too. Coffee is handed. The ladies, since the gentlemen entered, have become lively as larks. Conversation waxes brisk, brisk and merry. Colonel Dent and Mr. Eshton argue on politics. Their wives listen. 
The two proud dowagers, Lady Lynn and Lady Ingram, confabulate together. Sir George, whom, by the by, I have forgotten to describe, a, a very big and very fresh-looking country gentleman, stands before their sofa, coffee cup in hand, and occasionally puts in a word. Mr. Frederick Lynn has taken a seat beside Mary Ingram, and is showing her the engravings of a splendid volume. She looks, smiles now and then, but apparently says little. The tall and phlegmatic Lord Ingram leans with folded arms on the chair back of the little and lively Amy Eshton. She glances up at him and chatters like a wren. She likes him better than she does Mr. Rochester. Henry Lynn has taken possession of an ottoman at the feet of Louisa. Adele shares it with him. He is trying to talk French with her, and Louisa laughs at his blunders. With whom will Blanche Ingram pair? She is standing alone at the table, bending gracefully over an album. She seems waiting to be sought, but she will not wait too long. She herself selects a mate. Mr. Rochester, having quitted the Eshtons, stands on the hearth as solitary as she stands by the table. She confronts him, taking her station on the opposite side of the mantelpiece. Mr. Rochester, I thought you were not fond of children. Nor am I. Then what induced you to take charge of such a little doll as that? Pointing to Adele. Where did you pick her up? I did not pick her up. She was left on my hands. You should have sent her to school. <laughs> you should have gotten her out of the house, is what she's saying. You should, I don't want to see this girl here. Kick her out. <laughs> I could not afford it. Schools are so dear. Why, I suppose you have a governess for her. I saw a person with her just now. Is she gone? Oh no, there she is still behind the window curtain. You pay her, of course. I should think it quite as expensive. More so, for you have them both to keep in addition. I feared, or should I say hoped, the allusion to me would make Mr. Rochester glance my way, and I involuntarily shrank further into the shade, but he never turned his eyes. I have not considered the subject, said he indifferently, looking straight before him. No, you men never do consider economy and common sense. You should hear Mamma on the chapter of governesses. Mary and I have had, I should think, a dozen at least in our day, half of them detestable and the rest ridiculous, and all incubi. Were they not, Mamma? Did you speak my own? The young lady thus claimed as the dowager's special property reiterated her question with an explanation. My dearest, don't mention governesses. The word makes me nervous. I have suffered a martyrdom from their incompetency and caprice. I thank heaven I have now done with them. Mrs. Dentier bent, to the, bent over to the pious lady and whispered something in her ear. I suppose from the answer elicited, it was a reminder that one of the anathematized race was present. Tant pis, said her ladyship. I hope it may do her good. Then, in a lower tone, but still loud enough for me to hear, I noticed her. I am a judge of physiognomy, and in hers I see all the faults of her class. What are, what are they, madame? inquired Mr. Rochester aloud. I will tell you in your private ear, replied she, wagging her turban three times with portentous significancy. But my curiosity will be past its appetite. It craves food now. Ask Blanche. She is nearer you than I. Oh, don't refer him to me, Mamma. I have just one word to say of the whole tribe. They are a nuisance. Not that I ever suffered much from them. I took care to turn the tables. What tricks Theodore and I used to play on our Miss Wilsons and Mrs. Grays and Madame Robert. Mary was always too sleepy to join in a plot with spirit. The best fun was with Madame Jobert. Miss Wilson was a poor, sickly thing, lachrymose and low-spirited. Not worth the trouble of vanquishing, in short. And Mrs. Gray was coarse and insensible. No blow took effect on her. But poor Madame Jobert! I see her yet in her raging passions, when we had driven her to extremities, spilt our tea, crumbled our bread and butter, tossed our books up to the ceiling, and played a charivari with the ruler and desk, the fender and fire irons. Theodore, do you remember those merry days? Yes, to be sure I do, drawled Lord Ingram. And the poor old stick used to cry out, Oh, you villain's childs! And then we sermonized her on the presumption of attempting to teach such clever blades as we were when she was herself so ignorant. We did. And Tito, you know, I helped you in prosecuting, or persecuting your tutor, way-faced Mr. Vining, and the parson in the pip, as we used to call him. 
he and Miss Wilson took the liberty of falling in love with each other. At least Tito and I thought so. We surprised sundry, tender glances and sighs, which we interpreted as tokens of la belle passion. And I promise you the public soon had the benefit of our discovery. We employed it as a sort of lever to hoist our dead weights from the house. Dear Mamma, there, as soon as she got an inkling of the business, found out that it was un of an immoral tendency. Did you not, my lady mother? Certainly my best. And I was quite right, depend on that. There are a thousand reasons why liaisons between governesses and tutors should never be tolerated a moment in any well-regulated house. Firstly, oh gracious mamma, spare us the enumeration. Oh, rest, we know them. Danger of a bad example to innocence of childhood, distractions and consequent neglect of duty on the part of the attached, mutual alliance and reliance, confidence then resulting, insolence accompanying, mutiny and general blow-up. Am I right, Baroness Ingram, of Ingram Park? My lily flower, you are right now, as always. Then no more need be said. Change the subject. Amy Ashton, not hearing or not heeding this dictum, joined in with her soft, infantine tone. Louisa and I used to quiz our governess, too, but she was such a good creature she would bear anything. Nothing put her out. She was never cross with us, was she, Louisa? No, never. We might do what we pleased, ransack her desk and her workbox, and turn her drawers inside out. And she was so good-natured she would give us anything we asked for. I suppose now, said Miss Ingram, curling her lips sarcastically, we shall have an abstract of the memoirs of all the governesses extant. In order to avert such a visitation, I again move the introduction of a new topic. Mr. Rochester, do you second my motion? Madame, I support you on this point as on every other. Then on me be the onus of bringing it forward. Signor Eduardo, are you in voice tonight? Donna Bianca, if you command it, I will be. Then, signor, I lay on you my sovereign behest to furbish up your lungs and other vocal organs, as they will be wanted on my royal service. Who would not be the Rizzio of so divine a Mary? A fig for Rizzio, cried she, tossing her head with all its curls, as she moved to the piano. It is my opinion the fiddler David must have been an insipid sort of fellow. I like Black Bothwell better. To my mind, a man is nothing without a spice of the devil in him, and history may say what it will of James Hepburn, but I have a notion he was just the sort of wild, fierce, bandit hero whom I could have consented to gift with my hand, she says, staring intently at Mr. Rochester. Gentlemen, you hear! Now which of you most resembles Bothwell? cried Mr. Rochester. I should say the preference lies with you, responded Colonel Dent. "'On my honor, I am much obliged to you,' was the reply. Miss Ingram, who had now seated herself with proud grace at the piano, spreading out her snowy robes in queenly amplitude, commenced a brilliant prelude, taking, talking meantime. She appeared to be on her high horse tonight. Both her words and her air seemed intended to excite not only the admiration, but the amazement of her auditors. She was evidently bent on striking them as something very dashing and daring indeed.' "'Oh, I am so sick of the young men of the present day!' exclaimed she, rattling away at the instrument. "'Poor puny things, not fit to stir a step beyond Papa's park gates, nor to go even so far without Mama's permission and guardianship. Creatures so absorbed and care about their pretty faces and their white hands and their small feet, as if a man had anything to do with, be <laughs> with beauty. Oh, good God! As if loveliness were not the special prerogative of woman!' her legitimate appanage and heritage. I grant an ugly woman is a blot on the fair face of creation, but as to the gentlemen, let them be solicitous to possess only strength and valor. Let their motto be hunt, shoot, and fight. The rest is not worth a fillip. Such should be my device were I a man. Whenever I marry, she continued after a pause in which none interrupted, I am resolved my husband shall not be a rival, but a foil to me. I will suffer no competitor near the throne. I shall exact an undivided homage. His devotion shall not be shared between me and the shape he sees in his mirror. Mr. Rochester, now sing, and I will play for you. I am all obedience, was the response. Then here is a corsair song. 
know that I dote on the corsairs, and for that reason sing it con spirito. Commands from Miss Ingram's lips would put spirits into a mug of milk and water. Take care, then. If you don't please me, I will shame you by showing how such things should be done. That is offering a premium on incapacity. I shall now endeavor to fail. Gardez-vous en bien. If you err willfully, I shall devise a proportionate punishment. Miss Ingram ought to be Clement, for she has it in her power to inflict a chastisement beyond moral, mortal endurance. Ha! Huh, explain, commanded the lady. Pardon me, madame. No need of explanation. Your own fine sense must inform you that one of your frowns would be sufficient, would be a sufficient substitute for capital punishment. <laughs> Sing, said she, and again touching the piano, she commenced an accompaniment in spirited style. Now is my time to slip away, thought I, but the tones that then severed the air arrested me. Mrs. Fairfax had said Mr. Rochester possessed a fine voice. He did a mellow, powerful bass, into which he threw his own feeling, his own force, finding a way through the ear to the heart, and there waking sensation strangely. I waited till the last deep and full vibration had expired, till the tide of talk, checked an instant, had resumed its flow. I then quitted my sheltered corner and made my exit by the side door, which was fortunately near. Thence a narrow passage led into the hall. In crossing it, I perceived my sandal was loose. I stopped to tie it, kneeling down for that purpose on the mat at the foot of the staircase. I heard the dining room door unclose. A gentleman came out, rising hastily. Oh, rising hastily, I stood to face to face with him. It was Mr. Rochester. How do you do? He asked. I'm very well, sir. Why did you not come and speak to me in the room? I thought I might have retorted the question on him who put it. But I would not take that freedom. I answered, I did not wish to disturb you, as you seemed engaged, sir. What have you been doing during my absence? Nothing particular. Teaching Adele, as usual. And getting a good deal paler than you were, as I saw at first sight. What is the matter? Nothing at all, sir. Did you take any cold that night you half drowned me? Not the least. Return to the drawing room. You are deserting too early. I am tired, sir. He looked at me for a minute. And a little depressed, he said. What about? Tell me. Not nothing, sir. I am not depressed. But I affirm that you are. So much depressed that a few more words would bring tears to your eyes. Indeed, they are there now, shining and swimming, and a bead has slipped from the lash and fallen on to the flag. If I had time and were not in mortal dread of some prating prig of a servant passing, I would know what all this means. Well, tonight I excuse you, but understand that so long as my visitors stay, I expect you to appear in the drawing room every evening. It is my wish, don't neglect it. Now go, and send Sophie for Adele. Good night, my... He stopped, bit his lip, and abruptly left me. So that was chapter 17, such a dramatic chapter. How are we feeling? Jane and Mr. R are that emo couple in high school who sit like three feet apart holding hands and then waxing poetic about how they're so much more intellectual than the horny simpletons in the school. Yes, that's a great, that's yes. Yes, 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 Violet. Oh no, you don't throw books. If the house collapsed on everyone right now, you wouldn't be too far. You have so many questions. Yes, sure, voice some of them. If there is any questions that like aren't spoilers, I will gladly answer them i have to say though i love miss ingram she's so fun to read she's such a fun character to read she's so excited she's like the kind of character that i would love to play if this were like if this were a play i would love to portray her blanche ingram yes miss ingram is uh blanche ingram because she is the eldest so the eldest is called miss whatever the last name is. And then whoever is younger after that is called Miss Mary Ingram. I think Mary was the one. And then once Blanche would get married, um, she would become Mrs. Whatever. And the next eldest daughter would become Miss Ingram. Hello, Daxmort. Blanche is, you hate her, but also she's a mess and two up her own ass. Correct? <laughs> Yes, that is a correct assumption. Correct. <laughs> she like, I, I, in my head, she is, she like thinks that she's 
Elizabeth from Pride and Prejudice, and she's just going for it. She's just going for it. I love it. Bonch and her mom are real intense. Okay, yes, I agree. They're both very, very intense. I'll do my best to try and keep all of the different people straight, but there's so many different people that it gets a little bit confusing. I hope that I won't mix up voices, but... There were literally, like, what, like, eight characters introduced in, like, two pages, so... <laughs> you also hate how Blanche treats Adele. It's very similar to how Mrs. Reed treated Jane. Oh, yeah! Yeah, now that you mention it. Mm-hmm. There were always women like this. I think that maybe... Blanche's reaction to Adele is meant to imply not that she hates all children, but that she, you know, this is clearly some other woman's daughter in Mrs. Mr. Rochester's house, and she clearly is gunning for Mr. Rochester's uh, hand in marriage. And so she's like, what if we kicked out, like, she's like the stepmom who is like, what if we sent your children to a boarding school, like an evil cackling witch? <laughs> If it's not your child, send them away. She really thinks she's the hero in a story and Mr. R is her hero. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great way to put it. It's I find it so funny. <laughs> I love it so much. She's just, man, she's gotten for it. Some part of me, like, deeply vibes with her presentation, you know? I'm like, you go. You know what? You're being confident. You're making a fool of yourself, but you go. You just go off. The same way that, like, I watch really bad movies and I'm like, yeah, you do your thing. You know what? You don't know what you're doing, but you do it. And you do it 100%. I love that commitment. It's the same thing. <laughs> okay, so we will continue on in Chapter 18, but I need to be right back for a brief moment. Uh, for what you've told about Emma... Yeah. Emma's like a less parodic ver wow, yeah, that's that's so unfortunate. Poor Emma. Poor Emma. She could she could do better. <laughs> Poor Emma. Alright, I will be right back very quickly. Hello, I came back. <laughs> Just that she's a higher class lady who pushes her luck and the boundaries of what her case can actually give her. I don't remember. I know that I know that the Ingrams have a lot of money and I believe are from a titled family, so I think she is like kind of at the top of what you would want. I'm pretty sure that that is the case. Similarly to Emma, Emma's actually, like, her family is well-prestiged, they're old money, and Emma in the book is, like, a rare example of just a woman who possesses the, her, the land of the house and all of her own money. Um, so also, like, in a very, like, good position. So, like, but I think both of, both of those characters, Emma and Miss Ingram, are, like... <laughs> 
a little bit full of it because they can be. Like, I guess, I guess, you know, they're privileged. <laughs> she, Emma's extremely rich for a woman. <laughs> Emma's, Emma's incredibly rich for a woman. <laughs> and whoever she marries would take over her estate and like have her dowry and stuff like that she's she's like you know like she had she had like an amp i think she was worth what was it like forty thousand pounds was her dowry that's like a crap ton of money it's a lot of money that's a lot of money oh yeah yeah she's not i don't think she's titled i think that she, her family are like vaguely related to some people who are titled which means that they're basically not titled anyways I also love how Jane was like, let me take a lot of time to describe all of these women individually. And then the men came in and Jane was like, yeah, there was this one and this one and this one and this one. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just pointing that out. So, chapter 18. I don't know. I mean, it could be competition. It could just be that Jane likes looking at women more. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I don't think that actually Jane considers um, most of them competition. It's fine. Anyways, I just I just think that, you know, women seeing each other as competition. I think that that's... I don't think that that's what Jane is doing in this case. Um, merry days were these at Thornfield Hall, and busy days too. How different from the first three months of stillness, monotony, and solitude I had passed beneath its roof. All sad feelings seemed now driven from the house, all gloomy associations forgotten. There was life everywhere, movement all day long. You could not now traverse the gallery once so hushed, nor enter the front chambers once so tenantless, without encountering a smart lady's maid or a dandy valet. The kitchen, the butler's pantry, the servants' hall, the entrance hall were equally alive, and their saloons were only left void and still when the blue sky and halcyon sunshine of the genial spring weather called their occupants out into the grounds. Even when that weather was broken and continuous rain set in for some days, no damp seemed cast over enjoyment. Indoor amusements only became more lively and varied in consequence of the stop put to outdoor gaiety. I wondered what they were going to do the first evening a change of entertainment was proposed. They spoke of playing charades, but in my ignorance I did not understand the term. The servants were called in, the dining room tables wheeled away, the lights otherwise disposed, the chairs placed in a semicircle opposite the arch. While Mr. Rochester and the other gentlemen directed these alterations, the ladies were running up and down stairs ringing for their maids. Mrs. Fairfax was summoned to give information respecting the resources of the house in shawls, dresses, draperies of any kind. And certain wardrobes of the third story were ransacked, and their contents in the shape of brocaded and hooped petticoats, satin socks, black modes, lace lapets, and etc. were brought down in armfuls by the Abigails. Then a selection was made, and such things as were chosen were carried to the boudoir within the drawing room. Meantime, Mr. Rochester had again summoned the ladies round him, and was selecting certain of their number to be of his party. "'Miss Ingram is mine, of course,' said he. Afterwards he named the two Mrs. Eshton and Mrs. Dent. He looked at me. I happened to be near him, as I had been fastening the clasp of Mrs. Dent's bracelet, which had got loosed. "'Will you play?' he asked. I shook my head. He did not insist, which I rather feared he would have done. He allowed me to return quietly to my usual seat." He and his aides now withdrew behind the curtain. The other party, which was headed by Colonel Dent, sat down on the crescent of chairs. One of the gentlemen, Mr. Ashton, observed me, seeming to propose that I should be asked to join them, but Lady Ingram instantly negatived the notion. No, I heard her say, she looks too stupid for any game of the sort. Fuck, damn girl, all right. Why, why are you being so mean? Ere long a bell tinkled and the curtain drew up. Within the arch, the bulky figure of Sir George Lynn, who Mr. Rochester had likewise chosen, chosen, was seen enveloped in a white sheet. Before him, on a table, lay open a large book, and at his side stood Amy Eshton, draped in Mr. Rochester's cloak and holding a book in her hand. Somebody, unseen, rang the bell merrily. Then Adele, who had insisted on being one of her guardian's party, bounded forward, scattering round her the contents of a basket of flowers she carried on her arm. Then appeared the magnificent figure of Miss Ingram, clad in white, 
a long veil on her head, and a wreath of roses around her brow. By her side walked Mr. Rochester, <laughs> and together they drew near the table. They knelt, while Mrs. Dent and Louisa Eshton, dressed also in white, took up their stations behind them. A ceremony followed in dumb show, in which it was easy to recognize the pantomime of a marriage. At its termination, Colonel Dent and his party consulted in whispers for two minutes. Then the, for two minutes? Did you really need two minutes? I feel like that was clear. And the colonel called out, Bride! Mr. Rochester bowed, and the curtain fell. A considerable interval elapsed before it again rose. Its second rising displayed a more elaborately prepared scene than the last. The drawing room, as I have before observed, was raised two steps above the dining room, and on the top of the upper step, placed a yard or two back within the room, appeared a large marble basin, which I recognized as an ornament of the conservatory, where it usually stood, surrounded by exotics and tenanted by gold fish, and whence it must have been transported with some trouble on account of its size and weight. Seated on the carpet by the side of his basin was seen Mr. Rochester, costumed in shawls, with a turban on his head. His dark eyes and swarthy skin and painim features suited the costume exactly. He looked the very model of an eastern emir, an agent or a victim of the bowstring. Presently advanced into view Miss Ingram. She, too, was attired in oriental fashion, a crimson scarf tied sash-like round the waist, an embroidered handkerchief knotted about her temples, her beautiful molded arms bare, one of them upraised in the act of supporting a pitcher, poised gracefully on her head. Both her cast of form and feature, her complexion, and her general air suggested the idea of some Israelitish princess of the patriarchal days, and such was doubtless the character she intended to represent. She approached the basin and bent over it as if to fill her pitcher. She again lifted it to her head. The personage on the well brink now seemed to accost her, to make some request. She hastened, let down her pitcher on her hand, and gave him to drink. From the bosom of his robe he then produced a casket, opened it and showed magnificent bracelets and earrings. She acted astonishment and admiration. Kneeling, he laid the treasure at her feet. Incredulity and delight were expressed by her looks and gestures. The stranger fastened the bracelets on her arms and the rings in her ears. It was Eliza and Rebecca, but camels only were wanting. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Is it like a Bible thing? I don't know. Okay. The divining party again laid their heads together. Apparently, they could not agree about the word or syllable the scene illustrated. <laughs> okay, this is just Jane being like, by the way, I'm smarter than literally everybody. I know what all this stuff is. Colonel Dent, their spokesman, demanded the tableau of the whole, whereupon the curtain again descended. On its third rising, only a portion of the drawing room was disclosed, the rest being concealed by a screen, hung with some sort of dark and coarse drapery. The marble basin was removed. In its place stood a deal table and a kitchen chair, these objects were visible by a very dim light proceeding from a horn lantern, the wax candles being all extinguished. Amidst this sordid scene sat a man with his clenched hands resting on his knees, and his eyes bent on the ground. I knew Mr. Rochester, though the begrimed face, the disordered dress, his coat hanging loose from one arm, as if it had been almost torn from his back in a scuffle. The desperate and scowling countenance, the rough bristling hair might well have disguised him. As he moved, a chain clanked. To his wrists were attached fetters. Bridewell! exclaimed Colonel Dent, and the charade was solved. A sufficient interval having elapsed for the performers to resume their ordinary costume, they re-entered the dining room. Mr. Rochester led in Miss Ingram. She was complimenting him on his acting. Do you know, said she, that of the three characters I liked you in the last best? Oh, had you but lived a few years earlier, what a gallant gentleman highwayman you would have made. Is all the soot washed from my face, he asked, turning towards her. Alas, yes, the more's the pity. Nothing could be more becoming to your complexion than that ruffian's rouge. You would like a hero of the road, then? An English hero of the road would be the next best thing to an Italian bandit, and that could only be surpassed by a Levantine pirate. Well, whatever I am, remember you are my wife. We were married an hour since in the presence of all these witnesses. She giggled and her color <laughs> and her color rose. Now, Dent, continued Mr. Rochester, it is your turn. And as the other party withdrew, he and his band took the vacated seats. Miss Ingram placed herself at her leader's right hand. The other diviners filled the chairs on each side of him and her. I did not now watch the actors. I no longer waited with interest for the curtain to rise. 
My attention was absorbed by the spectators. My eyes, erewhile fixed on the arch, were now irresistibly attracted to the semicircle of chairs. What charade Colonel Dent and his party played, what word they chose, how they acquitted themselves, I no longer remember, but I still see the consultation which followed each scene. I see Mr. Rochester turn to Miss Ingram, and Miss Ingram to him. I see her incline her head towards him, till the... <laughs> Ooh! Till the jetty... Jetty curls almost touch his shoulder and wave against his cheek. I hear their mutual whisperings. I recall their interchanged glances, and something even of the feeling aroused by the spectacle returns in memory at this moment. I have told you, reader, that I had learnt to love Mr. Rochester. I could not unlove him now, merely because I found that he had ceased to notice me, because I might pass hours in his presence, and he would never once turn his eyes in my direction because I saw all his attentions appropriated by a great lady who scorned to touch me with the hem of her robes as she passed, who, if ever her dark and imperious eye fell on me by chance, would withdraw it instantly, as if from an object too mean to merit observation. I could not unlove him, because I felt sure he would soon marry this very lady, because I read daily in her a proud security in his intentions respecting her because I witnessed hourly in him a style of courtship which, if careless and choosing rather to be sought than to seek, was yet, in its very carelessness, captivating, and in its very pride, irresistible. There was nothing to cool or banish love in these circumstances, though much to create despair, much too, you will think, reader, to engender jealousy, if a woman in my position could presume to be jealous of a woman in Miss Ingram's. But I was not jealous, or very rarely, the nature of the pain I suffered could not be explained by that word. Miss Ingram was a mark beneath jealousy. She was too inferior to excite the feeling. Pardon the seeming paradox. I mean what I say. She was very showy, but she was not genuine. She had a fine person, many, many brilliant attainments, but her mind was poor, her heart barren by nature. Nothing bloomed spontaneously on that soil. No unforced natural fruit delighted by its freshness. She was not good, she was not original, she used to repeat sounding phrases from books, she never offered nor had an opinion of her own. She advocated a high tone of sentiment, but she did not know the sensations of sympathy and pity, tenderness and truth were not in her. Too often she betrayed this by the undue vent she gave to a spiteful antipathy she had conceived against little Adele, pushing her away with some contumelious epithet if she happened to approach her, sometimes ordering her from the room, and always treating her with coldness and acrimony. Other eyes besides mine watched these manifestations of character, watched them closely, keenly, shrewdly. Yes, the future bridegroom, Mr. Rochester himself, exercised over his intended a ceaseless surveillance, and it was from this sagacity, this guardedness of his, this perfect, clear consciousness of his fair one's defects, this obvious absence of passion and his sentiments toward her, that my ever-torturing pain arose. I saw he was going to marry her for family, perhaps political reasons, because her rank and connections suited him. I saw that he had not given her his love and that her qualifications were ill-adapted to win from him that treasure. This was the point. This was where the nerve was touched and teased. This was where the fever was sustained and fed. She could not charm him. If she had managed the victory at once, and he had yielded and sincerely laid his heart at her feet, I should have covered my face, turned to the wall, and figuratively have died to them. If Miss Ingram had been a good, noble woman, endowed with force, fervor, and kindness sense, I should have had one vital struggle, struggle with two tigers, jealousy and despair. Then, my heart torn out and devoured, I should have admired her, acknowledged her excellence, and been quiet for the rest of my days. And the more absolute her superiority, the deeper would have been my admiration, the more truly tranquil my quiescence. But as matters really stood, to watch Miss Ingram's efforts at fascinating Mr. Rochester, to witness their repeated failure, herself unconscious that they did fail, vainly fancying that each shaft launched hit the mark, and infatuatedly pluming herself on success when her pride and self-complacency repelled further and further what she wished to allure, to witness this was to be at once under ceaseless excitation and ruthless restraint. Because when she failed, I saw how she might have succeeded. Arrows that continually glanced off from Mr. Rochester's breast and fell harmless at his feet might, I knew, if shot by a surer hand, have quivered keen in his proud heart. 
have called love to his stern eye and softness into his sardonic face, or better still, without weapons, a silent conquest might have been won. Why can she not influence him more when she is privileged to draw so near to him, I asked myself. Surely she cannot truly like him, or not like him with true affection. If she did, she need not coin her smile so lavishly, flash her glances so unremittingly, manufacture airs so elaborate, graces so multitudinous. It seems to me that she might, by merely sitting quietly at his side, saying little and looking less, get nigher his heart. I have seen in his face a far different expression from that which hardens it now, while she is so vivaciously accosting him. But then it came of itself. It was not elicited by meretricious arts and calculated maneuvers, and one had but to accept it, to answer what he asked without pretension, to address him when needful without grimace, and it increased and grew kinder and more genial and warmed one like a fostering sunbeam. How will she manage to please him when they are married? I do not think she will manage it, and yet it might be managed, and his wife might, I verily believe, be the veriest ha very happiest woman the sun shines on. I have not yet said anything condemnatory of Mr. Rochester's project of marrying for interest and connections. It surprised me when I first discovered that such was his intention. I had thought him a man unlikely to be influenced by motives so commonplace in his choice of a wife. But the longer I considered the position, education, and etc. of the parties, the less I felt justified in judging and blaming either him or Miss Ingram for acting in conformity to ideas and principles instilled into them, doubtless, from their childhood. All their class held these principles. I suppose then they had reasons for holding them such as I could not fathom. It seemed to me that, were I a gentleman like him, I would take to my bosom only such a wife as I could love. But the very obviousness of the advantages to the husband's own happiness offered by this plan convinced me that there must be arguments against its general adoption of which I was quite ignorant. Otherwise I felt sure all the world would act as I wished to act. But in other points as well as this I was growing very lenient to my master. I was forgetting all his faults, for which I had once kept a sharp lookout. It had formerly been my endeavor to study all sides of his character, to take the bad with the good, and from the just weighing of both to form an equitable judgment. Now I saw no bad. The sarcasm had rep that had repelled, the harshness that had startled me once, were only like keen condiments in a choice dish. Their presence was a pungent, <laughs> was pungent, but their absence would be felt as comparatively insipid. And as for the vague something, was it a sinister or a sorrowful, a designing or a despondent expression, that opened upon a careful observer now and then into his in his eye, and closed again before one can fathom the strange depth partially disclosed, that something which used to make me fear and shrink, as if I had been wandering amongst volcanic-looking hills, and had suddenly felt the ground quiver, and seen it gape. That something I, at intervals, beheld still, and with throbbing heart, but not with palsied nerves. Instead of wishing to shun, I longed only to dare, to divine it, and I thought Miss Ingram happy because one day she might look into the abyss at her leisure and explore its secrets and analyze their nature. Oh, the anime laugh. Meantime, while I thought only of my master and his future bride, saw only them, heard only their discourse, and considered only their movements of importance, the rest of the party were occupied with their own separate interests and pleasures. The ladies Lynn and Ingram continued to consort in solemn conferences, where they nodded their two turbans at each other and held up their four hands in confronting gestures of surprise or mystery or horror according to the theme on which their gossip ran, like a pair of magnified puppets. Mild Mrs. Dent talked with good-natured Mrs. Eshton, and the two sometimes bestowed a courteous word or smile on me. Sir George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and Mr. Eshton discussed politics or country affairs or justice business. Lord Ingram flirted with Amy Eshton. Louisa played and sang, to and with one of the missers, Monsieur Lynn, and Mary Ingram listened languidly to the gallant speeches of the other. Sometimes all, as with one consent, suspended their by-play to observe and listen to the principal actors. For, after all, Mr. Rochester and, because closely connected with him, Miss Ingram, were the life and soul of the party. If he was absent from the room an hour, a perceptible dullness seemed to steal over the spirits of his guests, and his re-entrance was sure to give a fresh impulse to the vivacity of conversation. I wonder how much of that is true, and how much of that is Jane projecting. 
The want of his animating influence appeared to be peculiarly felt one day that he had been summoned to Millcote on business, and was not likely to return till late. The afternoon was wet. A walk the party had proposed to take to see a gypsy camp, lately pitched on a common beyond hay, was consequently deferred. Uh, some of the gentlemen were gone to the stables. The younger ones, together with the younger ladies, were playing billiards in the billiard room. The dowagers Ingram and Lynn sought solace in a quiet game at cards. Blanche Ingram, after having repelled by supercilious taciturnity some efforts of Mrs. Dent and Mrs. Eshton to draw her into conversation, had first murmured over some sentimental tunes and airs on the piano, and then, having fetched a novel from the library, had flung herself in haughty listlessness on a sofa, and prepared to beguile by the spell of fiction the tedious hours of absence. The room and the house were silent. Only now and then the merriment of the billiard players was heard from above. I'm just going to say, um, I apologize for the intense racism that's going to happen in this chapter, but here we go. <laughs> it was verging on dusk, and the clock had already given warning of the hour to dress for dinner, when little Adele, who knelt by me in the drawing-room window seat, suddenly exclaimed, Voilà, Monsieur Rochester, qui revient? I turned, and Miss Ingram darted forwards from her sofa. The others, too, looked up from their several occupations, for at the same time a crunching of wheels and a splashing tramp of horse hoofs became audible on the wet gravel. A post-chaise was approaching. "'What can possess him to come home in that style?' said Miss Ingram. "'He rode Mesror, the black horse, did he not, when he went out? And Pilot was with him. What has he done with the animals?' As she said this, she approached her tall person in ample garments so near the window that I was obliged to bend back almost to the breaking of my spine. In her eagerness, she did not observe me at first, but when she did, she curled her lip and moved to another casement. The post-chase stopped. The driver rang the doorbell, and a gentleman alighted a tired and traveling garb, but it was not Mr. Rochester. It was a tall, fashionable-looking man, a stranger. "'How provoking!' exclaimed Miss Ingram. "'You tiresome monkey!' apostrophizing Adele. "'Who perched you up in the window to give false intelligence?' And she cast on me an angry glance, as if I were in fault. Some parleying was audible in the hall, and soon the newcomer entered. He bowed to Lady Ingram as deeming her the eldest lady present. "'It appears I come at an inopportune time, madame,' said he, "'when my friend Mr. Rochester is from home.' But I arrive from a very long journey, and I think I may presume so far on an old and intimate acquaintance as to install myself here till he returns. His manner was polite, his accent in speaking struck me as being somewhat unusual, not precisely foreign, but still not altogether English. His age might be about Mr. Rochester's, between thirty and forty. His complexion was singularly sallow, otherwise he was a fine-looking man, at first sight especially. On closer examination, you detected something in his face that displeased, or rather, that failed to please. His features were regular, but too relaxed. His eye was large and well cut, but the life looking out of it was a tame, vacant life. At least, so I thought. At the sound of the dressing bell dispersed the party. It was not till after dinner that I saw him again. He then seemed quite at his ease, but I liked his physiognomy even less than before. It struck me as being at the same time unsettled and inanimate. inanimate. His eye wandered, and he had no meaning in its wandering. This gave him an odd look, such as I never remembered to have seen. For a handsome and not an unamiable-looking man, he repelled me exceedingly. There was no power in that smooth-skinned face of a full oval shape, no firmness in that aquiline nose and small cherry mouth. There was no thought on the low, even forehead, no command in that blank brown eye. As I sat in my usual nook and looked at him with the light of the girandoles on the mantelpiece beaming full over him, for he occupied an armchair drawn close to the fire and kept shrinking still nearer, as if he were cold, I compared him with Mr. Rochester. I think, with a deference be it spoken, the contrast could not be much greater between a sleek gander and a fierce falcon between a meek sheep and the rough-coated, keen-eyed dog, its guardian. He had spoken of Mr. Rochester as an old friend. A curious friendship theirs must have been, a pointed illustration indeed of the old adage that extremes meet. Two or three of the gentlemen sat near him, and I caught at times scraps of their conversation across the room. 
At first I could not make much sense of what I heard, for the discourse of Louisa Eshton and Mary Ingram, who sat nearer to me, confused the fragmentary sentences that reached me at intervals. These last were discussing the stranger. They both called him a beautiful man. Louisa said he was a love of a creature, and she adored him. And Mary instanced his pretty little mouth and nice nose as her ideal of the charming. And what a sweet-tempered forehead he has, cried Louisa. So smooth, none of those frowning irregularities I dislike so much, and such a placid eye and smile. And then, to my great relief, Mr. Henry Lynn summoned them to the other side of the room to settle some point about the deferred excursion to Hay Common. I was now able to concentrate my attention on the group by the fire, and I presently gathered that the newcomer was called Mr. Mason. Then I learned that he was but just arrived in England, and that he came from some hot country, which was the reason, doubtless, his face was so sallow, and that he sat so near the hearth, and wore a surtout in the house. Presently the words Jamaica, Kingston, Spanish Town indicated the West Indies as his residence, and it was with no little surprise I gathered ere long that he had there first seen and become acquainted with Mr. Rochester. He spoke of his friend's dislike of the burning heats, the hurricanes, and rainy seasons of that region. I knew Mr. Rochester had been a traveler, Mrs. Fairfax had said so, but I thought the continent of Europe had bounded his wanderings, till now I had never heard a hint of visits to more distant shores. I was pondering these things when an incident, and a somewhat unexpected one, broke the thread of my musings. Mr. Mason, shivering as someone chanced to open the door, asked for more coal to be put on the fire, which had burnt out its flame, though its mass of cinder still shone hot and red. The footman who brought the coal and going out stopped near Mr. Eshton's chair, and said something to him in a low voice, of which I heard only the words, Old woman, quite troublesome. "'Tell her she shall be put in the stocks if she does not take herself off,' replied the magistrate. "'No, stop!' interrupted Colonel Dent. "'Don't send her away, Eshton. We might turn the thing to account. Better consult the ladies.' And speaking aloud, he continued, "'Ladies, you talked of going to Hay Common to visit the gypsy camp. Sam here says that one of the old mother bunches is in the servants' hall at this moment, and insists upon being brought in before the quality to tell them of their fortunes. Would you like to see her?' "'Surely, Colonel,' cried Lady Ingram, "'you would not encourage such a low impostor. "'Dismiss her by all means at once.' "'But I cannot persuade her to go away, my lady,' said the footman, "'nor can any of the servants. "'Mrs. Fairfax is with her just now, entreating her to be gone, "'but she has taken a chair in the chimney corner "'and says nothing shall stir her from it till she gets leave to come in here.' "'What does she want?' asked Mrs. Eshton. "'To tell the gentry their fortunes,' she says, ma'am, "'and she swears she must and will do it.' "'What is she like?' inquired the Mrs. Eshton in a breath. "'A shockingly ugly old creature, miss, almost as black as a crock.' Yeah. "'Why, she's a real sorceress!' cried Frederick Lynn. "'Let us have her in, of course. "'She's black, must be magic!' "'To be sure,' rejoined his brother, "'it would be a thousand pities to throw away such a chance of fun.' "'My dear boys, what are you thinking about?' exclaimed Mrs. Lynn. "'I cannot possibly countenance any such inconsistent proceeding,' chimed the dowager Ingram. "'Indeed, mamma, but you can, and will,' pronounced the haughty voice of Blanche, as she turned round on the piano stool, where till now she had sat silent, apparently examining sundry sheets of music. "'I have a curiosity to hear my fortune told. Therefore, Sam, order the beldam forward.' "'My darling Blanche, recollect! I do. I recollect all you can suggest, and I must have my will. Quick, Sam!' "'Yes, yes, yes!' cried all the juveniles, both ladies and gentlemen. "'Let her come! It will be excellent sport!' The footman still lingered. "'She looks such a rough one,' said he. "'Go!' ejaculated Miss Ingram, and the man went. Excitement instantly seized the whole party. A running fire of raillery and jests were proceeding when Sam returned." She won't come now, said he. She says it's not her mission to appear before the vulgar herd. Them's her words. I must show her into a room by herself, and then those who wish to consult her must go to her one by one. You see now, my queenly Blanche, began Lady Ingram, she encroaches. Be advised, my angel girl, and show her into the library, of course, cut in the angel girl. It is not my mission to listen to her before the vulgar herd either. I mean to have her all to myself. Is there a fire in the library? Yes, ma'am, but she looks such a tinkler. 
Cease that chatter, blockhead, and do my bidding. <laughs> Again, Sam vanished, and mystery, animation, expectation rose to full flow once more. She's ready now, said the footman as he reappeared. She wishes to know who will be her first visitor. I think I had better just look in upon her before any of the ladies go, said Colonel Dent. Tell her, Sam, a gentleman is coming. Sam went and returned. She says, sir, that she'll have no gentleman. They need not trouble themselves to come near her. Nor, he added, with difficulty suppressing a titter, any ladies either except the young and single. By Jove, she has taste, exclaimed Henry Lynn. Miss Ingram rose solemnly. I go first, she said, in a tone which might have befitted the leader of a forlorn hope, mounting a breach in the van of his men. Oh, my best! Oh, my dearest! Pause! Reflect! was her mamma's cry, but she swept past her in stately silence, passed through the door which Colonel Dent held open, and we heard her enter the library. A comparative silence ensued. Lady Ingram thought it le to wring her hands, which she did accordingly. Miss Mary declared she felt for her part she never dared venture. Amy and Louisa Eshton tittered under their breath and looked a little frightened. The minutes passed very slowly. Fifteen were counted before the library door again opened. Miss Ingram returned to us through the arch. Would she laugh? Would she take it as a joke? All eyes met her with a glance of eager curiosity, and she met all eyes with one of rebuff and coldness. She looked neither flurried nor merry. She walked stiffly to her seat and took it in silence. Well, Blanche, said Lord Ingram. What did she say, sister? asked Mary. What do you think? Oh. What do you think? How do you feel? Is she a real fortune teller? demanded the Mrs. Ashton. Now, now, good people, returned Miss Ingram. Don't press upon me. Really, your organs of wonder and credulity are easily excited. You seem, by the importance of you all, my good mamma included, ascribed to this matter, absolutely to believe we have a genuine witch in the house who is in close alliance with the old gentleman. I have seen a gypsy vagabond. She has practiced in hackneyed fashion the science of palmistry and told me what such people usually tell. My whim is gratified, and now I think Mr. Eshton will do well to put the hag in the stocks tomorrow morning, as he threatened. Miss Ingram took a book, leant back in her chair, and so declined further conversation. I watched her for nearly half an hour. During all that time, she never turned a page, and her face grew momently darker, more dissatisfied and more sourly expressive of disappointment. She had obviously not heard anything to her advantage, and it seemed to me, from her prolonged fit of gloom and taciturnity, that she herself, notwithstanding her professed indifference, attached undue importance to whatever revelations had been made to her. Meantime, Mary Ingram, Amy, and Louisa Ashton declared they dared not go alone, and yet they all wished to go. A negotiation was opened through the medium of the ambassador, Sam, and after much pacing to and fro, till, I think, the said Sam's calves must have ached with the exercise, permission was at last, with great difficulty, extorted from the rigorous Sybil for the three to wait upon her in a body. Their visit was not so still as Miss Ingram's had been. We heard hysterical giggling and little shrieks proceeding from the library, and at the end of about twenty minutes they burst the door open and came running across the hall as if they were half scared out of their wits. I am sure she is something not right, they cried, one and all. She told us such things. She knows all about us. And they sank breathless into the various seats the gentlemen hastened to bring them. Pressed for further explanation, they declared she had told them of things they had said and done when they were mere children, described books and ornaments they had in their boudoirs at home, keepsakes that different relations had presented to them. They affirmed that she had even divined their thoughts, and had whispered in the ear of each the name of the person she liked best in the world, and informed them of what they most wished for. Here the gentlemen interposed with earnest petitions to be further enlightened on these last two named points, but they only got blushes, ejaculations, tremors, and titters in return for their importunity. The matrons, meantime, offered vinaigrettes and wielded fans, and again and again reiterated the expression of their concern that their warning had not been taken in time, and the elder gentlemen laughed, and the younger urged their services on the agitated fair ones. In the midst of the tumult, and while my eyes and ears were fully engaged in the scene before me, I heard a hem close at my elbow. I turned and saw Sam. If you please, miss, the gypsy declares that there is 
another young lady, young single lady in the room who has not been to see her yet, and she swears she will not go till she has seen all. I thought it must be you. There was no one else for it. What shall I tell her? Oh, I will go by all means, I answered, and I was glad of the unexpected opportunity to gratify my much excited curiosity. I slipped out of the room, unobserved by any eye, for the company were gathered in one mass about the trembling trio just returned, and I closed the door quietly behind me. If you like, miss, said Sam, I'll wait in the hall for you, and if she frightens you, just call and I'll come in. No, Sam, return to the kitchen. I'm not in the least afraid. Nor was I, but I was a good deal interested and excited. The end of chapter 18, a definite cliffhanger. Any thoughts as to chapter 18? These chapters are... Is it just me, or are these chapters longer than the ones before? What was Blanche told? Huh, nothing she happy about. Apparently, she's... Um, fortune tellers are all fake, and you guys are stupid for caring about them. She says. They seem longer. They seem longer to my throat. I'm like, we've only done two chapters, but my throat is telling me we've done more. Cheers, Harvest. Sorry, I'm gonna rest my throat for a second before the next chapter. Sure, what's up, Cece? <laughs> Cheers, Crethian. So much more water. It's my own fault for not drinking more water throughout the week. It is all my own fault. Let me fix my webcam. No, they, uh, there's a gypsy caravan that's like outside. And so the fortune, te like, the fortune teller came and somebody who was at the house introduced the fortune teller and people were trying to send the fortune teller away. So like, the servants that were mentioned were the people who were communicating in between the fortune teller and the group of noble people. Um, and the fortune teller ostensibly came from the gypsy caravan that is like out at Hay, Hay Commons, they said. It was a little bit confusing. There were a lot of names thrown around at once. <laughs> Ow. Yeah, the man who wrote in was, oh, what was his name? Mr. Mr. M? <laughs> he, I forget what his name was, but yes, he says that he is a friend or acquaintance or like longtime acquaintance or something of Mr. Rochester. They met in the West Indies and he says that he is so firmly acquainted with Mr. Rochester that even though Mr. Rochester is not currently there at the house, he decided, he was like, I'm pretty sure that I can take a room here and Mr. Rochester won't mind. So he did that. Mr. Mason. Yes. The ones who follow Gaston. Gaston. Uh, I, at least the trio of girls are the nice ones. Like, the mean ones are basically just... I mean, the, the girls are, like, nice-ish. There's, like, two ladies who are really nice. I think Mrs. Dent is really nice, and the Ashton girls, I believe, are really nice. And then Mary's, like, nice-ish. She's at least nicer than Blanche. Uh, I think. <laughs> That's fair, Harvest. I think that there's not as much to discuss in this chapter, but there will be in this next one, so. <laughs> Ooh. 
With that said... The Ingrams. It's mostly the arrogant uh, AF Ingrams. Yeah. Except for Mary, who's just like weirdly quiet. I'm a little concerned about Mary. Like, what's her deal? What What's wrong with her? Is she okay? Is it because Blanche is so mean that Mary is... What's her deal? Mary, Mary almost strikes me as maybe the Jane... Like, the Ingrams are the, are the Reeds, and Jane is... And Mary is Jane. It's almost how it strikes me. All right. Chapter 19. The library looked tranquil enough as I entered it, and the Sybil, if Sybil she were, was seated snug... <laughs> was seated snugly enough in an easy chair at the chimney corner. She had on a red cloak and black bonnet, or rather a broad-brimmed gypsy hat, tied down with a striped handkerchief under her chin. An extinguished candle stood on the table. She was bending over the fire and seemed reading in a little black book, like a prayer book, by the light of the blaze. She muttered the words to herself, as most old women do, while she read. She did not desist immediately on my entrance. It appeared she wished to finish a paragraph. I stood on the rug and warmed my hands, which were rather cold with sitting at a distance from the drawing-room fire. I felt now as composed as ever I did in my life. There was nothing indeed in the gypsy's appearance to trouble one's calm. She shut her book and slowly looked up. Her hat brim partially shaded her face, yet I could see as she raised it, raised it that it was a strange one. It looked all brown and black. Elf locks bristled out from beneath a white band which passed under her chin and came half over her cheeks, or rather jaws. Her eye confronted me at once with a bold and direct gaze. "'Well, and do you want your fortune told?' she said, in a voice as decided as her glance, as harsh as her features. "'I don't care about it, mother, but you may please yourself. But I ought to warn you I have no faith.' It's like your impudence to say so. I expected it of you. I heard it in your step as you crossed the threshold. Did you? You've a quick ear. I have, and a quick eye and a quick brain. You need them all in your trade. I do, especially when I've customers like you to deal with. Why don't you tremble? I'm not cold. Why don't you turn pale? I'm not sick. Why don't you consult my art? I'm not silly. The old crow nickered a laugh under her bonnet and bandage. <laughs> she then drew out a short black pipe and, lighting it, began to smoke. Having indulged a while in this sedative, she raised her bent body, took the pipe from her lips, and while gazing steadily at the fire, she said very deliberately, You are cold, you are sick, and you are silly. Prove it, I rejoined. I will, in few words. You are cold because you are alone. No contact strikes the fire from you that is in you. You are sick because the best of feelings, the highest and the sweetest given to man, keeps far away from you. You are silly because, suffer as you may, you will not beckon it to approach, nor will you stir one step to meet it where it waits you. She again put her short black pipe to her lips and renewed her smoking with vigor. You might say all of that to almost anyone you knew lived as a solitary dependent in a great house. I might say it to almost anyone, but would it be true of almost anyone? In my circumstances? Yes, just so. In your circumstances. But find me another pre precisely placed as you are. It would be easy to find you thousands. You could scarcely find me one. If you knew it, you are peculiarly situated. Very near happiness, yes, within reach of it. The materials are all prepared. There only wants a movement to combine them. Chance laid them somewhat apart. Let them be once approached, and bliss results. I don't understand enigmas. I never could guess a riddle in my life. If you wish me to speak more plainly, show me your palm. And I must cross it with silver, I suppose. To be sure. I gave her a shilling. She put it into an old stocking foot, which she took out of her pocket, and having tied it round and returned it, she told me to hold out my hand. I did. She approached her face to the palm and poured over it without touching it. "'It is too fine,' said she. "'I can make nothing of such a hand as that, almost without lines. Besides, what is in a palm? Destiny is not written there.' "'I believe you,' said I. "'No,' she continued. "'It is in the face.' 
on the forehead, about the eyes, in the lines of the mouth. Kneel and lift up your head. Ah, now you are coming to reality, I said, as I obeyed her. I shall begin to put some faith in you presently. I knelt within half a yard of her. She stirred the fire so that a ripple of light broke from the disturbed coal. The glare, however, as she sat, only threw her face into deeper shadow. Mine, it illumined. I wonder what feelings you came to me. I wonder with what feelings you came to me tonight, she said when she had examined me a while. I wonder what thoughts are busy in your heart during all the hours you sit in yonder room with the fine people flitting before you like shapes in a magic lantern, just as little sympathetic communion passes between you and them as if they were really mere shadows of human forms and not the actual substance. I feel tired often, sleepy sometimes, but seldom sad. Then you have some secret hope to buoy you up and please you with the whispers of the future. Not I. The utmost I hope is to save money enough out of my earnings to set up a school some day in a little house rented by myself. A mean nutriment for the spirit to exist on, and sitting in that window seat, you see I know your habits, you have learned them from the servants. Ah, you think yourself sharp? Well, perhaps I have. To speak truth, I have an acquaintance with one of them, Mrs. Poole. I started to my feet when I heard the name. You, you have, have you? thought I. There is dia diablerie in the business after all, then. Don't be alarmed, continued the strange being. She's a safe hand, is Mrs. Poole, close and quiet. Any one may repose confidence in her. But as I was saying, sitting in that window seat, do you think of nothing but your future school? Have you no present interest in any of the company who occupy the sofas and chairs before you? Is there not one face you study, one figure whose movements you follow with at least curiosity? I like to observe all the faces and all the figures. But you'd never single one from the rest. Or it may be two. I do frequently, when the gestures or looks of a pair seem telling a tale, it amuses me to watch them. What tale do you like best to hear? Oh, I have not much choice. They generally run on the same theme, courtship, and promise to end in the same catastrophe, marriage. And do you like that monotonous theme? Positively, I don't care about it. It is nothing to me. Nothing to you? When a lady, young and full of life and health, charming with beauty and endowed with the gifts of rank and fortune, sits and smiles in the eyes of a gentleman you. I what? You know, and perhaps think well of. Oh, you know, and perhaps think well of. I don't know the gentlemen here. I have scarcely interchanged a syllable with one of them, and as to thinking well of them, I consider some respectable and stately and middle-aged, and others young, dashing, handsome, and lively, but certainly they are all at liberty to be the recipients of whose smiles they please without my feeling disposed to consider the transaction of any moment to me. You don't know the gentlemen here. You have not exchanged a syllable with one of them. Will you say that of the master of the house? He is not at home. A profound remark, a most ingenious quibble. He went to Millcote this morning and will be back here tonight or tomorrow. Does that circumstance exclude him from the list of your acquaintance? Blot him as it were out of existence? No, but I can scarcely see what Mr. Rochester has to do with the theme you had introduced. I was talking of ladies smiling in the eyes of gentlemen, and of late so many smiles have been shed into Mr. Rochester's eyes that they overflow like two cups filled above the brim. Have you never remarked that? Mr. Rochester has a right to enjoy the society of his guests. No question about his right, but have you ever never observed that, of all the tales told here about matrimony, Mr. Rochester has been favoured with the most lively and the most continuous? The eagerness of a listener quickens the tongue of a narrator. I said this rather to myself than to the gypsy, whose strange talk, voice, manner had by this time wrapped me in a kind of dream. One unexpected sentence came from her lips after another, till I got involved in a web of mystification, and wondered what unseen spirit had been sitting for weeks by my heart watching its workings and taking record of every pulse. "'Eagerness of a listener!' repeated she. 
Yes, Mr. Rochester has sat by the hour, his ear inclined to the fascinating lips that took such delight in their task of communicating, and Mr. Rochester was so willing to receive and looked so grateful for the pastime given him. You have noticed this. Grateful? I cannot remember detecting gratitude in his face. Detecting? You have analyzed, then. And what did you detect if not gratitude? I said nothing. You have seen love, have you not? And looking forward, you have seen him married and beheld his bride happy? <laughs> Not exactly. Your witch's skill is rather at fault sometimes. What the devil have you seen then? Never mind. I came here to inquire, not to confess. Is it known that Mr. Rochester is to be married? Yes, and to the beautiful Miss Ingram. Shortly? Appearances would warrant that conclusion, and... Ah. And no doubt, though with an audacity that wants chastising out of you, you seem to question it. They will be superlatively, they will be a superlatively happy pair. He must love such a handsome, noble, witty, accomplished lady. And probably she loves him, or if not his person, at least his purse. I know she considers the Rochester estate eligible to the last degree, though, God pardon me, I told her something on that point about an hour ago which made her look wondrous grave. The corners of her mouth fell half an inch. I would advise her blackest suitor to look out. If another comes with a longer or clearer rent roll, he is dished. But, Mother, I did not come to hear Mr. Rochester's fortune. I came to hear my own, and you have told me nothing of it. Your fortune is yet doubtful. When I examined your face, one trait contradicted another. Chance has meted you a measure of happiness. That I know. I knew it before I came here this evening. She has laid it carefully on one side for you. I saw her do it. It depends on yourself to stretch out your hand and take it up. But whether you will do so is the problem I study. Kneel again on the rug. Don't keep me long. The fire scorches me. I knelt. She did not stoop towards me, but only gazed, leaning back in her chair. She began muttering, The flame flickers in the eye. The eye shines like dew. It looks soft and full of feeling. It smiles at my jargon. It is susceptible. Impression follows impression through its clear sphere. Where it ceases to smile, it is sad. An unconscious lassitude weighs on the lid. That signifies melancholy resulting from loneliness. It turns from me. It will not suffer scrut further scrutiny. It seems to deny, by a mocking glance, the truth of the discoveries I have already made, to disown the charge both of sensibility and chagrin. Its pride and reserve only confirm me in my opinion. The eye is favorable. As to the mouth, it delights at times in laughter. It is disposed to impart all that the brain conceives, though I dare say it would be silent on much the heart experiences. Mobile and flexible, it was never intended to be compressed in the eternal silence of solitude. It is a mouth which should speak much and smile often, and have human affection for its interlocutor. That feature, too, is propitious. I see no enemy to a fortunate issue but in the brow, and that brow professes to say, I can live alone if self-respect and circumstances require me so to do. I need not sell my soul to buy bliss. I have an inward treasure born with, it, with me, which can keep me alive if all extraneous delights should be withheld, or offered only at a price I cannot afford to give. The forehead declares, reason sits firm and holds the reins, and she will not let the feelings burst away and hurry her to wild chasms. The passions may rage furiously like true heathens as they are, and the desires may imagine all sorts of vain things, but judgment still shall have the last word in every argument, and the casting vote in every decision. Strong wind, earthquake shock, and fire may pass by, but I shall follow the guiding of that still small voice which interprets the dictates of conscience. Well said, forehead. Your declaration shall be respected. I have formed my plans, right plans I deem them, and in them I have attended to the claims of conscience, the counsels of reason. I know how soon youth would fade and bloom perish if, in the cup of bliss offered, but one dreg of shame or one flavor of remorse were detected, and I do not want sacrifice, sorrow, dissolution. Such is not my taste. I wish to foster, not to blight, to earn gratitude, not to wring tears of blood, no, nor of brine. My harvest must be in smiles, in endearments, in sweet. That will do. 
I think I rave in a kind of exquisite delirium. I should now wish to protract this moment ad infinitum, but I dare not. So far I have governed myself thoroughly. I have acted as I inwardly swore I would act, but further might try me beyond my strength. Rise, Miss Eyre. Leave me. The play is played out. Where was I? Did I wake or sleep? Had I been dreaming? Did I dream still? The old woman's voice had changed. Her accent, her gesture, and all were familiar to me as my own face in a glass, as the speech of my own tongue. I got up, but did not go. I looked. I stirred the fire, and I looked again, but she drew her bonnet and her bandage closer about her face, and again beckoned me to depart. The flame illuminated her hand stretched out. Roused now, and on the alert for discoveries, I at once noticed that hand. It was no more the withered limb of Eld than my own. It was a rounded, supple member, with smooth fingers, symmetrically turned. A broad ring flashed on the little finger, and, stooping forward, I looked at it and saw a gem I had seen a hundred times before. Again I looked at the face, which was no longer turned from me. On the contrary, the bonnet was doffed, the bandage displaced, the head advanced. "'Well, Jane, do you know me?' asked the familiar voice. "'Only take off the red cloak, sir, and then—' "'But the string is in a knot. Help me. Break it, sir. There, then. Off, ye lendings!' And Mr. Rochester stepped out of his disguise. "'Now, sir, what a strange idea!' "'But well carried out, eh? Don't you think so? "'With the ladies you must have managed well. "'But not with you. "'You did not the act the character of a gypsy with me. "'What character did I act? My own? "'No, some unaccountable one. "'In short, I believe you have been trying to draw me out. "'Or in. "'You have been talking nonsense to make me talk nonsense. "'It is scarcely fair, sir. "'Do you forgive me, Jane? "'I cannot tell till I have thought it all over.' If, on reflection, I find I have fallen into no great absurdity, I shall try to forgive you, but it was not right. Oh, you have been very correct, very careful, very sensible. I reflected and thought, on the whole, I had. It was a comfort, but, indeed, I had been on my guard almost from the beginning of the interview. Something of the masquerade I suspected. I knew gypsies and fortune-tellers did not express themselves as this seeming old woman had expressed herself. Besides, I had noted in her feigned voice her anxiety to conceal her features. But my mind had been running on Grace Poole, that living enigma, that mystery of mysteries, as I considered her. I had never thought of Mr. Rochester. Well, said he, what are you musing about? What does that grave smile signify? Wonder and self-congratulation, sir. I have your permission to retire now, I suppose? No. Stay a moment and tell me what the people in the drawing room yonder are doing. Discussing the gypsy, I dare say. Sit down. Let me hear what they said about me. I had better not stay long, sir. It must be near eleven o'clock. Oh, are you aware, Mr. Rochester, that a stranger has arrived here since you left this morning? A stranger? No. Who can it be? I expected no one. Is he gone? No. He said he had known you long and that he could take the liberty of installing himself here till you returned. The devil he did! Did he give his name? His name is Mason, sir, and he comes from the West Indies, from Spanish Town in Jamaica, I think. Mr. Rochester was standing near me. He had taken my hand as if to lead me to a chair. As I spoke, he gave my wrist a convulsive grip. The smile on his lips froze. Apparently a spasm caught his breath. Mason! The West Indies! he said, in the tone one might fancy a speaking automaton to announce its single words. Mason! The West Indies! he reiterated and he went over the syllables three times, growing, in the same intervals of speaking, wider than ashes. He hardly seemed to know what he was doing. "'Do you feel ill, sir?' I inquired. "'Jane, I've got a blow. I've got a blow, Jane,' he staggered. "'Oh, lean on me, sir. Jane, you offered me your shoulder once before. Let me have it now.' "'Yes, sir, yes. And my arm.' He sat down and made me sit beside him. Holding my hand in both his own, he chafed it gazing on me at the same time with the most troubled and dreary look. "'My little friend,' said he, "'I wish I were in a quiet island with only you, "'and trouble and danger and hideous recollections removed from me. "'Can I help you, sir? I'd give my life to serve you. "'Jane, if aid is wanted, I'll seek it at your hands. "'I promise you that. Thank you, sir. "'Tell me what to do. I'll try at least to do it. "'Fetch me now, Jane, a glass of wine from the dining room. "'They will be at supper there.' and tell me if Mason is with them, and what he is doing. 
I went. I found all the party in the dining room at supper, as Mr. Rochester had said. They were not seated at table. The supper was arranged on the sideboard, each had taken what he chose, and they stood about here and there in groups, their plates and glasses in their hands. Every one seemed in high glee. Laughter and conversation were general and animated. Mr. Mason stood near the fire, talking to Colonel and Mrs. Dent, and appeared as merry as any of them. I filled a wine glass. I saw Miss Ingram watch me frowningly as I did so. She thought I was taking a liberty, I dare say. And I returned to the library. Mr. Rochester's extreme pallor had disappeared, and he looked once more firm and stern. He took the glass from my hand. "'Here is to your health, ministered spirit,' he said. He swallowed the contents and returned it to me. "'What are they doing, Jane?' "'Laughing and talking, sir. They don't look grave and mysterious, as if they had heard something strange?' "'Not at all. They are full of jests and gaiety. And Mason? He was laughing, too. If all these people came in a body and spat at me, what would you do, Jane?' "'Turn them out of the room, sir, if I could,' he half-smiled. "'But if I were to go to them, and they only looked at me coldly "'and whispered sneeringly amongst each other, "'and then dropped off and left me one by one, what then? "'Would you go with them?' "'I rather think not, sir. "'I should have more pleasure in staying with you. "'To comfort me?' "'Yes, sir, to comfort you as well as I could. "'And if they laid you under a ban for adhering to me? "'I probably should know nothing of their ban.' And if I did, I should care nothing about it. Then you could dare censure me, censure, for my sake? I could dare it for the sake of any friend who deserved my adherence, as you, I am sure, do. Go back now into the room. Step quietly up to Mason and whisper in his ear that Mr. Rochester is come and wishes to see him. Show him in here and then leave me. Yes, sir. I did his behest. The company all stared at me as I passed straight among them. I sought Mr. Mason, delivered the message, and preceded him from the room. I ushered him into the library, and then I went upstairs. At a late hour, after I had been in bed some time, I heard the visitors repair to their chambers. I distinguished Mr. Rochester's voice, and heard him say, "'This way, Mason. This is your room.' He spoke cheerfully. The gay tones set my heart at ease. I was soon asleep. Hello, Apple Man. So that was chapter 20. Let me see here. Oh. Oh, damn. The next chapter is really good. It's also really long. Uh, the next chapter is a really good chapter. I might try to push through this next chapter. It's just, it's just that it's a very good one. Cheers, Nat Merrick, and cheers, Crithian. Mason is suspicious. He is. Uh, the second fortune that Mr. Rochester gave to Jane didn't really... He was examining her face and describing what, basically, personality effects he could glean from the delineaments of her face. And then halfway through, he just kind of stopped talking about her face and started, like, ranting. Pretty much. Um, yeah, so he wasn't really giving a fortune. He just kind of started talking to himself. Who is Jane Eyre? Jane Eyre is... A book that we're reading but Jane Eyre is the protagonist of the book um, the book so far has covered like s basically her life from starting off in like a terrible family with an encounter with the supernatural going off to school there being an outbreak of typhoid at the school her friend dying um, her becoming a teacher and then becoming a governess moving into Mr. Rochester's house teaching his uh, ward, Adele, and now having some kind of a relationship with Mr. Rochester, while all at the same time there is clearly something happening at Thornfield Hall that nobody is telling her. Something is wrong. She thinks it has something to do with Grace Poole. Um, maybe this Mr. Mason. I'm not sure that... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what Jane thinks about Mr. Mason. Yes. That is it. We've been reading this book at the book club. We do it every Sunday at three. Um, 
And there are archives, and you can catch up if you would like. Yeah. Does anybody have any thoughts on um, Mr. Rochester dressing up as a gypsy to... 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 Whatever he was doing? To do whatever he was doing? You've seen similar and possibly- Nobody is- Nobody is- I thought it was so weird when I read this. I was like, this guy is creepy. Seems kind of insane. People in those times got bored. The charade seems super complicated. That's fair. You missed the part where it was Mr. R. Yes, it was Mr. Rochester. <laughs> the old woman was Mr. Rochester. And he just like... Yeah, he just like starts ranting and then t and then it's like yep jane it's me you guessed correctly da -da -da -da! and he removes his cloak and he's like it is i very weird oh that's no um what the what he told her it, he said that he told her something about the thornfield estate um he said that like basically the way that th that fortune had gone she was extremely excited and thought the Thornfield estate was very eligible, but she had learned something of late from the gypsy that troubled her as to its eligibility, and that he now thought that if there were some eligible bachelor who had a bigger estate or fortune than he did, that she would go off to them instead, or an equally sized one. So, yes. So that's why she was, like, freaked out. So she learned something about the estate. Feels like some prank, like he was bored with his guests. It's a very elaborate prank. And only the young single women. I always thought it was creepy. That chapter is less filled with racism than I remember. I remember, I remember first reading that and being pretty appalled by the stuff that they said about the gypsies. But, you know, they were mean, but... They're mean to everybody, so... <laughs> you know. Blanche being racist isn't something that's out of character, I guess. Okay. So. We are going to read this chapter. And, ooh, hang on. Let me check and see where this chapter ends. I want to know if it ends on a cliffhanger. Got it. Okay. I see where we are. Uh, this this will be the last chapter we read for today, then. And what a chapter it will be. No spoilers indeed, Jackie. <laughs> Got it. I also know Jane Eyre. I love Jane Eyre. But there are people in the chat who are reading for the first time with us. So we are no spoilering. <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah, we're on chapter 20 now. Exclamation point PDF if you would like a uh, PDF of the book to follow along. Thank you for asking too, Jackie. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I really appreciate the conscientiousness. <laughs> Cheers, Crethian. A manga adaptation? I would love to read that. This book goes some places. No worries, Apple Man. Thanks for coming. I expect, I don't know, um, I'll be streaming on Tuesday and Thursday at 3 as well. Variety games. So you can always pop back in then. Your first time listening along? <laughs> awesome, thanks! <laughs> Ah, I don't want you guys to catch up to me, but it's too late. You already have. Indeed, Harvest. Indeed. <laughs> Bye! Alright. This chapter will definitely kill my throat, but that's why we're definitely ending on it. It's just that... I'm... Uh, 
I'm so excited to see what you guys have to say about this chapter. So here we go. I've ruined so many people, Kratian, with that game. Like, like so many people at this point. And I keep roping more people in. We gotta expand the guild. I've got like three people who want to join. <laughs> okay. Chapter 20. Okay, good. Then when I finish, I will do it. You know what I mean. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. Going back. Chapter 20. I had forgotten to draw my curtain, which I usually did, and also to let down my window blind. The consequence was that when the moon, which was full and bright, for the night was fine, came in her glory came in her course to that space in the sky opposite my casement and looked in at me through the unveiled panes. Her glorious gaze roused me. Awakening in the dead of night, I opened my eyes on her disc, silver white and crystal clear. It was beautiful, but too solemn. I half rose and stretched my arm to draw the curtain. Good God, what a cry! The night, its silence, its rest, was rent in twain by a savage, a sharp, a shrilly sound that ran from end to end of Thornfield Hall. My pulse stopped, my heart stood still, my stretched arm was paralyzed. The cry died and was not renewed. Indeed, whatever being uttered that fearful shriek could not soon repeat it. Not the widest winged condor on the Andes could, twice in succession, send out such a yell from the cloud shrouding his eerie. The thing delivering such utterance must rest ere it should repeat the effort. It came out of the third story, for it passed overhead. And overhead, yes, in the room just above my chamber ceiling, I now heard a struggle, a deadly one it seemed from the noise, and a half-smothered voice shouted, Help! 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 Three times, rapidly. Will no one come? It cried. And then, while the staggering and stamping went on wildly, I distinguished through plank and plaster, Rochester! Rochester, for God's sake, come! A chamber door opened. Someone ran or rushed along the gallery. Another step stamped on the flooring above, and something fell, and there was silence. I had put on some clothes, though horror shook all my limbs. I issued from my apartment. The sleepers were all aroused. Ejaculations, terrified murmurs sounded in every room, door after door unclosed. One looked out and another looked out. The gallery filled. Gentlemen and ladies alike had quitted their beds, and, Oh, what is this? Who is hurt? What has happened? Fetch a light. Is it fire? Are there robbers? Where shall we run? Was demanded confusedly on all hands. But for the moonlight, they would have been in complete darkness. They ran to and fro. They crowded together. Some sobbed. Some stumbled. The confusion was inextricable. "'Where the devils is Rochester?' cried Colonel Dent. "'I cannot find him in his bed.' "'Here! Here!' was shouted in return. "'Be composed, all of you. I'm coming.' And the door at the end of the gallery opened, and Mr. Rochester advanced with a candle. He had just descended from the upper story. One of the ladies ran to him directly. She seized his arm. It was Miss Ingram. "'What awful event has taken place?' said she. "'Speak! Let us know the worst at once!' D "'But don't pull me down or strangle me,' he replied, "'for the Mrs. Ashton were clinging about him now, "'and the two dowagers in vast white wrappers "'were bearing down on him like ships in full sail. "'All's right, all's right,' he cried. "'It's a mere rehearsal of much ado about nothing. "'Ladies, keep off, or I shall wax dangerous.' "'And dangerous he looked. "'His black eyes darted sparks.' Calming himself by an effort, he added, A servant has had the nightmare, that is all. She is an excitable, nervous person. She construed her dream into an apparition, or something of that sort, no doubt, and has taken a fit with fright. Now then, I must see you all back into your rooms, for, till the house is settled, she cannot be looked after. Gentlemen, have the goodness to set the ladies the example. Miss Ingram, I am sure you will not fail in evincing superiority to idle terrors. Amy and Louisa, return to your nests like a pair of doves, as you are. Madame, to the dowagers, you will take cold to a dead certainty if you stay in this chill gallery any longer. And so, by dint of alternate coaxing and demanding, he contrived to get them all at once more enclosed in their separate dormitories. I did not wait to be ordered back to mine, but retreated unnoticed, as unnoticed I had left it. Not, however, to go to bed. On the contrary, I began and dressed myself carefully. The sounds I had heard after the scream and the words that had been uttered had probably been heard only by me, for they had proceeded from the room above mine, 
but they assured me that it was not a servant's dream which had thus struck horror through the house, and that the explanation Mr. Rochester had given was merely an invention framed to pacify his guests. I dressed then to be ready for emergencies. When dressed, I sat a long time by the window looking out over the silent grounds and silvered fields and waiting for I knew not what. It seemed to me that some event must follow the strange cry, struggle, and call. No, stillness returned. Each murmur and movement ceased gradually, and in about an hour Thornfield Hall was again as hushed as a desert. It seemed that sleep and night had resumed their empire. Meantime, the moon declined. She was about to set. Not liking to sit in the cold and darkness, I thought I would lie down on my bed, dressed as I was. I left the window and moved with little noise across the carpet. As I stooped to take off my shoes, a cautious hand tapped low at the door. "'Am I wanted?' I asked. "'Are you up?' asked the voice I expected to hear. "'My master's.' "'Yes, sir.' "'And dressed?' "'Yes. Come out, then, quietly.' I obeyed. Mr. Rochester stood in the gallery, holding a light. "'I want you,' he said. "'Come this way. Take your time and make no noise.' My slippers were thin. I could walk the matted floor as softly as a cat. He glided up the gallery and up the stairs, and stopped in the dark, low corridor of the fateful third story. I had followed and stood at his side. "'Are you a sponge in your room?' he asked in a whisper. "'Are you a sponge? Have you a sponge in your room?' <laughs> "'Are you a sponge?' "'Yes, sir. Have you any salts? Volatile salts?' "'Yes. Go back and fetch both.' I returned, sought the sponge on the washstand and the salts in my drawer, and once more retraced my steps. He still waited. He held a key in his hand. Approaching one of the small black doors, he put it in the lock. He paused and addressed me again. You don't turn sick at the sight of blood. I think I shall not. I have never been tried yet. I felt a thrill while I answered him, but no coldness and no faintness. Just give me your hand, he said. It will not do to risk a fainting fit. I put my fingers into him, his. Warm and steady, was his remark. He turned the key and opened the door. I saw a room I remembered to have seen before, the day Mrs. Fairfax showed me over the house. It was hung with tapestry, but the tapestry was now looped up in one part, and there was a door apparent, which had then been concealed. This door was open. A light shone out of the room within. I heard thence a snarling, snatching sound, almost like a dog quarreling. Mr. Rochester, putting down his candle, said to me, Wait a minute, and he went forward to the inner apartment. A shout of laughter greeted his entrance, noisy at first and terminating in Grace Poole's own goblin. Ha! Ha! She then was there. He made some sort of arrangement without speaking, though I heard a low voice address him. He came out and closed the door behind him. Here, Jane, he said, and I walked round to the other side of a large bed, which with its drawn curtains concealed a considerable portion of the chamber. An easy chair was placed near the bedhead. A man sat in it, dressed with the exception of his coat. He was still, his head leant back, his eyes were closed. Mr. Rochester held the candle over him. I recognized in his pale and seemingly lifeless face the stranger, Mason. I saw, too, that his linen on one side and one arm was almost soaked in blood. Hold the candle, said Mr. Rochester, and I took it. He fetched a basin of water from the washstand. Hold that, said he. I obey. He took the sponge, dipped it in, and moistened the corpse-like face. He asked for my smelling bottle, and applied it to the nostrils. Mr. Mason shortly unclosed his eyes. He groaned. Mr. Rochester opened the shirt of the wounded man, whose arm and shoulder were bandaged. He sponged away blood, trickling fast down. "'Is there immediate danger?' murmured Mr. Mason. "'Pooh! No! A mere scratch! Don't be over so overcome, man! Bear up! I'll fetch a surgeon for you now, myself!' He'll be able to be removed by morning, I hope. Jane, he continued. Sir, I shall have to leave you in this room with this gentleman for an hour, or perhaps two hours. You will sponge the blood as I do when it returns. If he feels faint, you will put the glass of water on that stand to his lips and your salts to his nose. You will not speak to him on any pretext, and, Richard, it will be at the peril of your life if you speak to her. Open your lips, agitate yourself, and I'll not answer for the consequences. Again, the poor man groaned. He looked as if he dared not move. Fear, either of death or of something else, appeared almost to paralyze him. Mr. Rochester put the now bloody sponge into my hand, and I proceeded to use it as he had done. He watched me a second, then saying, Remember, no conversation. He left the room. 
I experienced a strange feeling as the key grated in the lock, and the sound of his retreating steps ceased to be heard. Here then I was in the third story, fastened into one of its mystic cells, night around me, a pale and bloody spectacle under my eyes and hands, a murderess hardly separated from me by a single door. Yes, that was appalling. The rest I could bear, but I shuddered at the thought of Grace Poole bursting out upon me. I must keep to my post, however. I must watch this ghastly countenance, these blue, still lips forbidden to unclose, these eyes now shut, now opening, now wandering through the room, now fixing on me, and ever glazed with the dullness of horror. I must dip my hand again and again in the basin of blood and water, and wipe away the trickling gore. I must see the light of the unsnuffed candle wane on my employment, the shadows darken on the wrought antique tapestry round me, and grow black under the hangings of the vast old bed, and quiver strangely over the doors of a great cabinet opposite, whose front, divided into twelve panels, bore, in grim design, the heads of the twelve apostles, each enclosed in its separate panel, as in a frame, while above them at the top rose an ebon crucifix, and a dying Christ. According as the shifting obscurity and flickering gleam hovered here or glanced there, it was now the bearded physician Luke that bent his brow, now St. John's long hair that waved, and anon the devilish face of Judas that grew out of the panel and seemed gathering life and threatening a revelation of the arch-traitor, of Satan himself, in his subordinate's form. Amidst all this I had to listen, as well as watch, to listen for the movements of the wild beast or the fiend in yonder side den. But since Mr. Rochester's visit, it seemed spellbound. All the night I heard but three sounds at three long intervals. A step creak, a momentary renewal of the snarling canine noise, and a deep human groan. Then my own thoughts worried me. What crime was this that lived incarnate in this sequestered mansion, and could neither be expelled nor subdued by the owner? What mystery that broke now in fire and now in blood at the deadest hours of night? What creature was it that, masked in an ordinary woman's face and shape, uttered the voice now of a mocking demon and anon of a carrion-seeking bird of prey? And this man I bent over, this commonplace, quiet stranger, how had he become involved in the web of horror? And why had the fury flown at him? What made him seek this quarter of the house at an untimely season when he should have been asleep in bed? I had heard Mr. Rochester assign him an apartment below. What brought him here? And why, now, was he so tame under the violence or treachery done him? Why did he so quietly submit to the concealment Mr. Rochester enforced? Why did Mr. Rochester enforce this concealment? His guest had been outraged, his own life on a former occasion had been hideously plotted against, and both attempts he smothered in secrecy and sank in oblivion. Lastly, I saw Mr. Mason was submissive to Mr. Rochester, that the impetuous will of the latter held complete sway over the inertness of the former. The few words which had passed between them ensured me of this. It was evident that in their former intercourse the passive disposition of the one had been habitually influenced by the active energy of the other. Whence then had arisen Mr. Rochester's dismay when he heard of Mr. Mason's arrival? Why had the mere name of this unresisting individual, whom his word now sufficed to control like a child, fallen on him a few hours since as a thunderbolt might fall on an oak? Midwifery, thank you for following. Enjoy your apprenticeship here. Oh, I could not forget his look and his paleness when he whispered, Jane, I have got a blow. I have got a blow, Jane. I could not forget how the arm had trembled which had rested on my shoulder, and it was no light matter which could thus bow the resolute spirit and thrill the vigorous frame of Fairfax Rochester. "'When will he come? When will he come?' I cried inwardly as the night lingered and lingered, as my bleeding patient drooped, moaned, sickened, and neither day nor aid arrived. I had again and again held the water to Mason's white lips, again and again offered him the stimulating salts. My efforts seemed ineffectual. Either bodily or mental suffering or loss of blood or all three combined were fast prostrating his strength. He moaned so and looked so weak, wild, and lost, I feared he was dying, and I might not even speak to him. The candle, wasted at last, went out. As it expired, I perceived streaks of gray light edging the window curtains. Dawn was then approaching. Presently I heard Pilot bark far below, out of his distant kennel in the courtyard. Hope revived. Nor was it unwarranted. 
In five minutes more, the grating key, the yielding lock, warned me my watch was relieved. It could not have lasted more than two hours. Many a week has seemed shorter. Mr. Rochester entered, and with him the surgeon he had been to fetch. Now, Carter, be on the alert, he said to this last. I give you but half an hour for dressing the wound, fastening the bandages, getting the patient downstairs, and all. But is he fit to move, sir? No doubt of it. It is nothing serious. He is nervous. His spirits must be kept up. Come, set to work. Mr. Rochester drew back the thick curtain, drew up the hall in blind, let in all the daylight he could, and I was surprised and cheered to see how far dawn was advanced, what rosy streaks were beginning to brighten the east. Then, was anybody stirring below when you went down, Jane? inquired Mr. Rochester presently. Oh, oops, sorry. I skipped a page. Then he approached Mason, whom the surgeon was already handling. Now, my good fellow, how are you? he asked. She's done for me, I fear, was the faint reply. Not a whit. Courage! This day fortnight you'll hardly be a pin the worse of it. You've lost a little blood, that's all. Carter, assure him there's no danger. I can do that conscientiously, said Carter, who had now undone the bandages. Only I wish I could have got here sooner. You would not have bled so much. But how is this? The flesh on the shoulder is torn as well as cut. This one was not done with a knife. There have been teeth here! She bit me, he murmured. She worried me like a tigress when Rochester got the knife from her. You should not have yielded. You should have grappled with her at once, said Mr. Rochester. But under such circumstances, what could one do? returned Mason. Oh, it was frightful, he added, shuddering, and I did not expect it. She looked so quiet at first. I warned you, was his friend's answer. I said, be on your guard when you go near her. Besides, you might have waited till tomorrow and had me with you. It was mere folly to attempt the interview tonight and alone. I thought I could have done some good. You thought! You thought! Yes, it makes me impatient to hear you. But however, you have suffered and are likely to suffer enough for not taking my advice, so I'll say no more. Carter, hurry! Hurry! The sun will soon rise and I must have him off. Directly, sir. The shoulder is just bandaged. I must look to this other wound in the arm. She has had her teeth here, too, I think. She sucked the blood. She said she'd drain my heart, said Mason. I saw Mr. Rochester shudder. A singularly marked expression of disgust, horror, hatred warped his countenance almost to distortion. But he only said, Come, be silent, Richard, and never mind her gibberish. Don't repeat it. I wish I could forget it, was the answer. You will when you are out of the country. When you get back to Spanish Town, you may think of her as dead and buried. Or rather, you need not think of her at all. Impossible to forget this night. It is not impossible. Have some energy, man. You thought you were as dead as a herring two hours since, and you are all alive and talking now. There. Carter has done with you, or nearly so. I'll make you decent in a trice. Jane, he turned to me for the first time since his re-entrance, take this key. Go down into my bedroom and walk straight forward into my dressing room. Open the top drawer of the wardrobe and take out a clean shirt and neck, ne neck handkerchief. Bring them here and be nimble. I went, sought the repository he had mentioned, found the articles named, and returned with them. Now, said he, go to the other side of the bed while I order his toilet, but don't leave the room. You may be wanted again. I retired as directed. "'Was anybody stirring below when you went down, Jane?' inquired Mr. Rochester presently. "'No, sir. All was very still. "'We shall get you off cannily, Dick, and it will be better, both for your sake and for that of the poor creature in yonder. "'I have striven long to avoid exposure, and I should not like it to come at last. "'Here, Carter, help him on with his waistcoat. "'Where did you leave your furred cloak? "'You can't travel a mile without that, I know, in this damned cold climate. "'In your room?' Jane, run down to Mr. Mason's room, the one next mine, and fetch a cloak you will see there. Again I ran, and again returned, bearing an immense mantle lined and edged with fur. Now I have another errand for you, said my untiring master. You must away to my room again. What a mercy you are shod with velvet, Jane. A clod-hopping messenger would never do at this juncture. You must open the middle drawer of my toilet table and take out a little file and a little glass you will find there. Quick. I flew thither and back, bringing the desired vessels. That's well. Now, doctor, I shall take the liberty of administering a dose myself on my own responsibility. I got this cordial at Rome of an Italian charlatan. 
A fellow you would have kicked, Carter. It is not a thing to be used indiscriminately, but it is good upon occasion, as now, for instance. Jane, a little water. He held out the tiny glass, and I half filled it from the water bottle on the washstand. That will do. Now wet the lip of the vial. I did so. He measured twelve drops of a quimson ri liquid and presented it to Mason. Drink, Richard. It will give you the heart you lack for an hour or so. But will it hurt me? Is it inflammatory? Drink! 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 Mr. Mason obeyed because it was evidently useless to resist. He was dressed now. He still looked pale, but he was no longer gory and sullied. Mr. Rochester let him sit three minutes after he had swallowed the liquid. Then he took his arm. Now I am sure you can get on your feet, he said. Try. The patient rose. Carter, take him under the other shoulder. Be of good cheer, Richard. Step out. That's it. I do feel better, remarked Mr. Mason. I am sure you do. Now, Jane, trip on before us away to the back stairs. Unbolt the side passage door and tell the driver of the post chase you will see in the yard, or just outside, for I told him not to drive his rattling wheels over the pavement, to be ready. We are coming. And, Jane, if anyone is about, come to the foot of the stairs and hem. It was by this time half past five, and the sun was on the point of rising, but I found the kitchen still dark and silent. The side passage door was fastened. I opened it with as little noise as possible. All the yard was quiet, but the gate stood wide open, and there was a post chaise with horses ready harnessed, and the driver seated on the box, stationed outside. I approached him and said that, and said the gentlemen were coming. He nodded, and then I looked carefully round and listened. The stillness of early morning slumbered everywhere. The curtains were yet drawn over the servants' chamber windows. Little birds were just twittering in the blossom-blanched orchard trees, whose boughs drooped like white garlands over the wall enclosing one side of the yard. The carriage horses stamped from time to time in the closed stables. All else was still. The gentlemen now appeared. Mason, supported by Mr. Rochester and the surgeon, seemed to walk with tolerable ease. They assisted him into the chase. Carter followed. "'Take care of him,' said Mr. Rochester to the latter, "'and keep him at your house till he is quite well. I shall ride over in a day or two to see how he gets on. "'Richard, how is it with you?' Fresh air revives me, Fairfax. Leave the window open on his side, Carter. There is no wind. Goodbye, Dick. Fairfax, what is it? Let her be taken care of. Let her be treated as tenderly as may be. Let her... He stopped and burst into tears. I do my best, and have done it, and will do it, was the answer. He shut up the chaise door, and the vehicle drove away. "'Yet would to God there was an end to, of all of this!' added Mr. Rochester, as he closed and barred the heavy yard gates. This done, he moved with slow step and abstracted air towards a door in the wall bordering the orchard. orchard. I, supposing he had done with me, prepared to return to the house. Again, however, I heard him call, "'Jane!' He had opened the portal and stood at it, waiting for me. "'Come where there is some freshness for a few moments,' he said. "'That house is a mere dungeon. Don't you feel it so?' "'It seems to me a splendid mansion, sir.' "'The glamour of inexperience is over your eyes,' he answered. "'And you see it through a charmed medium. "'You cannot discern that the gilding is slime "'and the silk draperies cobwebs, "'that the marble is sordid slate "'and the polished woods mere refuse chips and scaly bark. "'Now here,' he pointed to the leafy enclosure we had entered, "'all is real, sweet, and pure.' "'He strayed down a walk edged with box with apple trees, pear trees, and cherry trees on one side, and a border on the other, full of all sorts of old-fashioned flowers, stalks, sweet williams, primroses, pansies, mingled with southern wood, sweet briar, and various fragrant herbs. They were fresh now, as a succession of April showers and gleams, followed by a lovely spring morning, could make them. The sun was just entering the dappled east, and his light illumined the wreathed and dewy orchard trees, and shone down the quiet walks under them. "'Jane, will you have a flower?' He gathered a half-blown rose, the first on the bush, and offered it to me. "'Thank you, sir. "'Do you like the sunrise, Jane? "'That sky with its high and light clouds "'which are sure to melt away as the day waxes warm? "'This placid and balmy atmosphere?' "'I do, very much. "'You have passed a strange night, Jane.' "'Yes, sir. "'And it has made you look pale. "'Were you afraid when I left you alone with Mason?' I was afraid of some one coming out of the inner room. But I had fastened the door. I had the key in my pocket. I should have been a careless shepherd if I had left a lamb, my pet lamb, so near a wolf's den, unguarded. You were safe. 
Will Grace Poole live here still, sir? Oh, yes. Don't trouble your head about her. Put the thing out of your thoughts. Yet it seems to me your life is hardly secure while she stays. Never fear. I will take care of myself. Is the danger you apprehended last night gone by now, sir? I cannot vouch, vouch for that till Mason is out of England, nor even then. To live for me, Jane, is to stand on a crater crust which may crack and spew fire any day. But Mr. Mason seems a man easily led. Your influence, sir, is evidently potent with him. He will never set you at defiance or willfully injure you. Oh, no, Mason will not defy me, nor, knowing it, will he hurt me. But, unintentionally, he might in a moment, by one careless word, deprive me, if not of life, yet forever of happiness. Tell him to be cautious, sir. Let him know what you fear, and show him how to avert the danger. He laughed sardonically, hastily took my hand, and as hastily threw it from him. If I could do that, simpleton, where would the danger be? Annihilated in a moment. Ever since I have known Mason, I have only had to say to him, Do that, and the thing has been done. But I cannot give him orders in this case. I cannot say, Beware of harming me, Richard, for it is imperative that I should keep him ignorant that harm to me is possible. Now you look puzzled, and I will puzzle you further. You are my little friend, are you not? I like to serve you, sir, and to obey you in all that is right. Precisely, I see you do. I see genuine content contentment in your gait and mien, your eye and face when you are helping me and pleasing me, working for me and with me in, as you characteristically say, all that is right. For if I bid you do what you thought was wrong, there would be no light-footed running, no neat-handed alacrity, no lively glance and animated complexion. My friend would then turn to me, quiet and pale, and would say, No, sir, that is impossible. I cannot do it, because it is wrong and would become immutable as a fixed star. Well, you too have power over me, and may injure me, yet I dare not show you where I am vulnerable, lest, faithful and friendly as you are, you should transfix me at once. If you have no more to fear from Mr. Mason than you have from me, sir, you are very safe. God grant it may be so. Here, Jane, is an arbor. Sit down. The arbor was an arch in the wall, lined with ivy, it contained a rustic seat. Mr. Rochester took it, leaving room, however, for me, but I stood before him. Sit, he said. The bench is long enough for two. You don't hesitate to take a place at my side, do you? Is that wrong, Jane? I answered him by assuming it. To refuse would, I felt, have been unwise. Now, my little friend, when the sun drinks the dew, while all the flowers in this old garden awake and expand, and the birds fetch their young ones' as breakfast out of the thornfield hall, out of the thorn field, and the early bees do their first spell of work. I'll put a case to you, which you must endeavor to suppose your own, but first look at me and tell me you are at ease and not fearing that I err in detaining you or that you err in staying. No, sir, I am content. Well then, Jane, call to aid your fancy. Suppose you were no longer a girl well-reared and disciplined, but a wild boy indulged from childhood upwards. Imagine yourself in a remote foreign land, conceived that you there commit a capital error, no matter of what nature or from what motives, but one whose consequences must follow you through life and taint all your existence. Mind, I don't say a crime. I am not speaking of shedding of blood or any other guilty act which might make the perpetrator m amenable to the law. My word is error. The results of what you have done become in time to you utterly insupportable. You take measures to obtain relief, unusual measures, but neither unlawful nor culpable. Still you are miserable, for hope has quitted you on the very confines of life. Your sun at noon darkens in an eclipse, which you feel will not leave it till the time of setting. Bitter and base associations have become the sole food of your memory. You wander here and there, seeking rest in exile, happiness and pleasure. I mean in heartless, sensual pleasure, such as dulls intellect and blights feeling. Heart weary and soul withered, you come home after years of voluntary banishment. You make a new acquaintance. How or where, no matter. You find in this stranger much of the good and bright qualities which you have sought for twenty years and never before encountered. They are all fresh, healthy, without soil and without taint. 
Such society revives, regenerates. You feel better. You feel better days come back. Higher wishes, purer feelings. You desire to recommence your life and to spend what remains to you of days in a way more worthy of an immortal being. To attain this end, are you justified in overleaping an obstacle of custom, a mere conventional impediment which neither your conscience sanctifies nor your judgment approves? He paused for an answer. And what was I to say? Oh, for some good spirit to suggest a judicious and satisfactory response. Vain aspiration. The west wind whispered in the ivy round me, but no gentle aerial borrowed its breath as a medium of speech. The birds sang in the treetops, but their song, however sweet, was inarticulate. Again Mr. Rochester propounded his query. Is the wandering and sinful, but now rest-seeking and repentant man, justified in daring the world's opinion in order to attach to him forever this gentle, gracious, genial stranger, thereby securing his own peace of mind and regeneration of life? Sir, I answered, a wanderer's repose or a sinner's reformation should never depend on a fellow creature. Men and women die, philosophers falter in wisdom, and Christians in goodness. If any one you know has suffered and erred, let him look higher than his equals for strength to amend and solace to heal. But the instrument, the instrument, God who does the work ordains the instrument. I have myself, I tell it you without parable, been a worldly, dissipated, restless man, and I believe I have found the instrument for my cure in... He paused. The birds went on caroling, the leaves lightly rustling. I almost wondered they did not check their songs and whispers to catch the suspended revelation, but they would have had to wait many minutes, so long was the silence protracted. At last I looked up at the tardy speaker. He was looking eagerly at me. "'Little friend,' he sa said he, in quite a changed tone, while his face changed too, losing all its softness and gravity and becoming harsh and sarcastic. "'You have noticed my tender penchant for Miss Ingram. Don't you think if I married her she would regenerate me with a vengeance?' He got up instantly, went quite to the other end of the walk, and when he came back, he was humming a tune. "'Jane, Jane,' said he, stopping before me, "'you are quite pale with your vigils. "'Don't you curse me for disturbing your rest? "'Curse you?' "'No, sir.' "'Shake hands in confirmation of the word. "'What cold fingers! "'They were warmer last night when I touched them "'at the door of the mysterious chamber. "'Jane, when will you watch with me again?' "'Whenever I can be useful, sir.' For instance, the night before I am married, I am sure I shall not be able to sleep. Will you promise to sit up with me to bear me company? To you I can talk of my lovely one, for now you have seen her and know her. Yes, sir. She's a rare one, is she not, Jane? Yes, sir. A strapper, a real strapper, Jane, big, brown, and buxom, with hair just as the ladies of Carthage must have had. Bless me, there's a dent and a lin in the stables. Go in by the shrubbery through that wicket. As I went one way, he went another, and I heard him in the yard, saying cheerfully, "'Mason got the start of you all this morning. He was gone before sunrise. I rose at four to see him off.'" And that is the end of chapter 20 and where we will end the reading for today. What do you all make of chapter 20? <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh it's really why i really wanted to read the chapter i was like yeah let's end on this one this will be a good one super curious as to what he's on about with the error slash mistake <laughs> not a crime i assure you that was something yeah, wasn't it? It was a something from start to finish. <laughs> from start to finish. Any any guesses? Any thoughts? Any curiosities? Any any thoughts on where we might go from here? There was a lot. There was a lot. There was... Woo! You spooked me! Don, thank you for the 100 bits and letting the bit pony ride! Woof! There was um, the sounds in the middle of the night, everybody freaking out and getting up from their bed. 
Jane getting dressed and waiting for a long time, Mr. Rochester coming to get her, her having to, like, look after this guy who was bleeding to death, um, much cryptic conversation, him leaving, and then Rochester having more cryptic conversation, and then being like, and then I'm gonna marry Ingram. At least we got confirmation that Mr. R is also in love with Jane. What do you believe is this confirmation? Didn't he just say that he was going to marry Miss Ingram? <laughs> it's more implied than confirmed. My little friend. My little friend. Say hello to my little friend. He was like, before my wedding, I totes want to sit and watch the sunrise with you. Yeah. 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 He definitely keeps cutting himself off before uh, calling Jane terms of endearment, I do suppose. But he also is like, I'm marrying this other lady. So love means nothing. You know, platonically, like a friend. I can talk to you about anything, platonically, like a friend. I can talk to you about how amazing Miss Ingram is, can't I? He stopped right before admitting, right before admitting he stopped himself and then he changes the subject. Mm, so Cece definitely feels like Mr. Rochester is, uh, do you all, a hundred, does everybody feel like Mr. Rochester is in love with Jane or is the, is anybody skeptical? Does anybody think that he's like, being duplicitous do you think that he's a hundred percent in love so everybody's just like a hundred percent truly in love no tricks no games full-on just <laughs> love ghost all right interesting interesting makes sense he's he sure is putting himself out there in the in me in me what do you guys think of the mysterious, the mysteriousness in the middle of the night? Somebody being both stabbed with a knife and bitten. Snarling sounds coming from the next room. Going by how he's acting, it's more he's fond of her, but he's marrying someone else. So yeah, a bit awkward. <laughs> but Mrs. Ingram. Uh, Mrs. Ingram, she's so good. Werewolf? Vampire? Oh, interesting. Interesting. Hmm. 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 You immediately thought vampire. At that time you had to marry for station. Yeah, you did have to marry at first station at that time. Um, I mean, certainly Miss Ingram wants to marry for that. And I guess the Ingrams are titled, so it would... Pro it, joining their like it, both extremely wealthy estates together is probably a no-brainer but like god could you imagine having to spend your life with Blanche could you imagine I feel like I don't know I feel like you couldn't pay me <laughs> I feel like you like she has a nice dowry but you couldn't pay me for that she's a lot all right, so our thoughts on the snarling thing through the door are werewolves and vampires. <laughs> yeah, I know, but Jane! <laughs> Everybody much prefers Jane. Jane's a sassy one, though. I almost feel like if Jane just, if Jane just, like, said her, all of her thoughts out loud, I don't know how much nicer she'd be. Like, clearly Jane is capable of finer feelings than, uh, than Miss Ingram is, but Jane also is a little bit, like, she was just dunking on all the rich people, left and right, she was crushing them. <laughs> Snarling. <laughs> I assume. I guess that makes more sense for, do vampires snark? Sass and snark are your favorite things, you're like, eh, it's charming. Eh. She also doesn't say it out loud, so... You know, I'm sure all of us have, you know, some mean thoughts that we think and then are like, I shouldn't say that, maybe shouldn't even think that, that's mean. <laughs> so, difference between her and 
Miss Ingram. Also, Miss Ingram also does genuinely seem to believe that she's, like, literally inherently superior to everybody, which, like, is a thing in the day. If you're titled, everybody literally thinks that you are inherently superior to everybody else. But still. It was cool that he didn't really like his house, but he liked nature more. You think it's good that um, Mr. Rochester is a fan of nature and not necessarily a fan of his, like, fancy mansion? He said it was covered in slime, though, so really does not like it. <laughs> All right, my throat is hurting. So I'm gonna start winding down the stream so that I can start talking less. Oh, wait, 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 no, I want to know. But I'm like super here for people's thoughts. You're also wondering if he told Blanche a secret to make her more likely to jump on anyone else with as much influence. Oh, so you think he's trying to make Blanche less interested in him on purpose is what you think. Cause I was thinking it could have been like, it could have been like, a test of like her loyal like that seems like something mr rochester would do like that seems like something he would do would be to like test her but you think that he was trying to like get her not interested in him the creature would be a warg <laughs> he just keeps a he just keeps a warg up in this room Considering the guy posed as a gypsy, testing is very much on brand. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you guys know that, like, being a person who is as completely terrified of spoilers as I am, um, I hope you know that I'm not, l with my questions, the questions that I'm asking you, I'm not trying to lead you in any particular direction. I'm not leading you. Yeah. I'm just engaging the discussion so yeah good good i just i'm just hoping that you know mm -hmm. it could have been a test he also tested jane in a similar way when she started with a verbal debate yeah he was like show me all of your handiwork and he's such a weirdo <laughs> i just think mr rochester is really a weirdo him and jane do seem to like be on the same wavelength though he totally like they totally seem like those two philosophy students, you know? Those two philosophy majors. Yeah. I think they're better than everybody else. <laughs> Here, let me put on some music. All right. Please continue sharing your thoughts, but as we wind down the stream, would anybody like to share one good thing that happened to them today or one good thing they're looking forward to tomorrow? Uh, my good thing for today, I'm sorry this is so nerdy, my good thing for today is that I reached level 40 in Shop Titans and finally got to purchase the expansion for my shop. I'm very excited about it. Trying to catch up with Shop Titans. That's fair. That's your good thing? <laughs> good. I swear, at this point, Shop Titans needs to sponsor me. Everybody go tweet at the official Shop Titans Twitter handle and let them all know that you got the game from me and that they should pay me some money for sponsoring them. That was a joke. Don't do that. Unless you want to. You can totally do that. I'm not be upset about it, but you know. Your good thing is that your campsite was finished in Animal Crossing and you should have a visitor tomorrow. And you didn't get stung by wasps today. That's awesome. Look at you making your way through Animal Crossing. Oh, that's so wonderful. I know some of the things that are going to happen and I'm excited for you to experience them. You don't have enough points to give me a drink of water? Thank you. I believe that this one is both Crethians and Obi-Wan's. So cheers to you both. And the cup is done. If we did that same thing when I was addicted to the rhythm games, I would have gotten so much money. God, imagine. And then I would have been able to use that money 
on the game. Oh, that would have been cool. Your good thing is that you have a night off work because of the public holiday. Yay. I'm glad you have another night off work, especially since I assume it hasn't gotten any less crazy. Do I have protein drink? I don't. I drank it before the stream this time. Hmm. But I might, I might eventually go back to the other protein shake. We'll have to see because the stuff that my doctor wanted me to have is very expensive and I don't think I can continue taking it. <laughs> Having today off, but work tomorrow and then two days off and also adding things to your Animal Crossing Island. That's great. Well, I, I mean, a day off work and then two days off is like pretty nice. Almost makes the work feel like a vacation. Maybe that's a particularly me thing but that's how i always felt about it when like you're, you you have days off and then work and followed by days off it just feels like you were like volunteering for a day instead of working for a day you know i don't know thanks harvest oh retail uh, well well <laughs> yeah <laughs> eat cricket for 500 points i think i would need far more money or money or magic points to eat a cricket. I've heard that they're very good. I, I would eat a cricket if it was like, if it had been used in the broth of a ramen, but only if I didn't need to see the cricket, I'm afraid of bugs. Mm. So you're really hanging for nights off. That makes like, yeah, that's a lot to deal with. Cricket powder for sale? Eh, that's fine. I am fine. Listen, crickets are an extremely good source of protein. They're very renewable. It's like a great thing. I'm not knocking on it. I'm down to give it a shot. Not now. Maybe when I'm like 50, you know? Like, I'm very pro cricket. Just like, I don't want to eat it right now. <laughs> I don't like bugs. I don't like them. My fear of bugs. Oh my god! Eat a spider for even less points? Are you insane? <laughs> you hate me. Also excited for this week as long as I take good care of my health. No pushing too hard. I will do my best. As if my voice can recover. Does the game have voice acting harvest? Steady on there, Satan. <laughs> No, but most of it doesn't need to be read. Hmm. Okay. We'll s we shall see. We shall see on which day it shall be. Finally able to start on a knitting project for you instead of gifts for friends and family. Oh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad you get to do something that you're like personally interested in for yourself. What is it? If I may ask, no need to say if it is a private matter. The music. Hang on, I need to ask somebody something real quick. May the, may the rainbow blanket be finished. Rainbow blanket? That's awesome. I type fast. It's just loud. But I'll, well, yeah, I do type fast. You're correct. Final Fantasy 7 R. You also just might crash and sleep most of the day off. That's been me trying to decide between playing Final Fantasy and like sleeping and resting. That's me. <laughs> Very similar. 
Uh, so close to being finished with it, kind of, maybe, possibly. I don't know. I'm just seeing if we can set up a raid here real quick. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, we're checking on it. We're checking. Your sleeping pattern has been non-existent. So you're the most tired you've been in ages. Okay, let me, let me, okay, I'm just gonna. Okay, sorry. I'm just like, I'm sitting here being like, is, can I raid? Can has raid? Raid has? Can? You'll post pics once it's done. It might take a bit. At least, at three skines each. Th wait, three? Okay, hang on. Three skines each of six colors. So, eight, so 18 skines. But you're already done with purple. Oh my god, that seems like a lot of work. You must be so, you must be such a fast knitter. Sleeping pattern... But you're starting to feel better. My sleeping pattern's been so messed up too, Krethian. It's been absolutely bonkers. Uh, it's been absolutely messed up. You got typing skills? Thanks. <laughs> I, I, right. So, I feel like I do. Have you guys ever done those, like, word per minute things? Those, like, typing out word per minutes? I, I once... When I very first started streaming, I said, hey, I type at about, um, what was it? It was like word per minute, right? I think I type at about 100 words per minute. Um, and like some guy on the stream didn't believe me and like challenged me to a competition because he was certain that he could type faster than me. And I'm like, Okay, sure. So we did it. We we challenged each other and of course I got I got like 99 words per minute because that's the speed that I type at and I beat him and I'm like why did why why did why was this why did I okay, you just didn't believe me. You can type 4 words per minute. It's bulky yarn. Ah, so it knits quick. You probably average speed to slow knitter, but you just have a lot of free time and the pattern is easy. If you say so, you're a very prolific knitter, so I feel like, I don't know, I don't know. I would say at least average speed. I wouldn't assume that you're slow, just from how many projects you've gotten through versus other people that I know who've knitted and how long it takes them to get through it. You have done years ago. You can type real quick with your head as it is now, being super tired, you're prone to making a lot of spelling mistakes. Yeah, I'm still getting used to the keyboard that I currently have now, so I make like way more typos than I used to. Oh, you used to transcribe? Woof. <laughs> Woof. That's brutal. <laughs> That's a lot. On his stream alone, so it's noticeable. I mean, same. Same. All right. So we are going to raid. There is a um, old friend of the stream who is currently streaming a game called Mischief Makers, and it is a charity stream for the... COVID-19 relief. So I feel like it's a good cause, a good person to support. Those of you who remember Charlie, it is Charlie. Um, and we're gonna be we're gonna be given in a raid, so I absolutely won't, Crathian. Don't you worry. So let's get in there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming to the stream. I hope you're enjoying Jane Eyre, and I will see you guys again on the next Sunday for further continuation of the story. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Rating in five, four, three, two, one.